All right. Let's center ourselves here. And... Uh, oh, yes. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I still have plenty of coffee. Yeah, I, I probably got half. I have, I have had two mouth ulcers in the last three weeks. Oh man, that's no fun. When one, it took a week. When one got healed, another one was like, nope, hi, me now. Rachel's had one like under her tongue. Ugh. And it's like giving her like referred pain, like down her neck. And my, mine, mine are both just... in the front of my mouth. So every word is agony. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It's great. Ugh. Yeah. So she... if I'm a little quiet today. Understandable. That's why. So I'm having to take like the tini tiniest, tiniest little oh, sips, which gosh, is yeah. why I've still got plenty. Oh man. I took the lid off. But... Rachel's used this like Mucinex spray type stuff that like helps like numb. Yeah. Mouth a little yeah. Bit. You can do that. My yeah. dentist actually gave me a special tooth toothpaste it's like really some like ultra mm. ultra ultra sensitive stuff interesting um mm. closest is what it's called c-l-o-c-y-s-y-s -S. i had to order it can't get well, it in stores yeah but apparently okay. it's not helping so whatever oh geez i'm sorry <laughs> uh, it's okay that sucks well, i'm gonna make it thanks for pushing through yeah man for the for the people for the audience yes they deserve it <laughs> all right all right all right take two hang on yeah okay yeah <laughs> we're good mike's yeah. plugged in all right. Test. Yep. Okay. We got levels. It's registering. We do. Okay. All right. Let's do it. Let's. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to episode number 112 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about flushing pilot pens with bulb syringes. How do we do that? Down the toilet? We'll find out. Oh my God. Stay tuned. Number 14 will shock you. Uh, a 2024 Goulet Sailor exclusive? Question mark. If next level pens above the Pilot Custom A23 is worth the price jump, which pens that I would be able to take with me if my daughter staged a coup and forced me out? Very that's specific not, question. That's uncool. I can foresee a situation where this might actually happen. So it's good for me to think through. Um, pens that we have a love-hate relationship with, as I think we all do have some. Uh, we're going to talk about Sailor's Warranty Warnings. And we're going to spotlight the Magna Carta Mag 1000, the big old honker. So look forward to that. And we'll start it off with some feedback. Yes, beating back. All right, Mo is coming at us, coming at us hot, y'all. Right, Mo, Mo says, hey, y'all, just bought some stickers and thought I would share my pen box. This is the first time I've bought stickers for the box, but I have lots because y'all are awesome. Love these new pen cast stickers. Now, when is the next dragon coming? Mm. So Mo has a box. He keeps his pens in and his box is covered in stickers. That's cool. And uh, Mo's box has some oldies on it, Brian. We, they've got like some of the yeah. old like artwork based pens. Oh, yeah. I saw like the heavy metal hand that I drew with the <laughs> yeah. pen in it. So some OG OG yeah. stickers. Mo, there. Mo's been around. Mo, yeah, Mo's, respect. Yeah, respect. Well, Mo, thank you. But but they need Mo pen need, stickers. Mo, Mo stickers. Yes. Mo stickers Mo for sticker. their Mo, Mo, for Mo yes. sticker box. They have Mo stickers because they belong to Mo. But oh. they need Mo. Can Mo. always use Mo Mo, Mo stickers. Mo Mo stickers. <laughs> Mo Mo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mo. Sorry. I'm an idiot. Uh, next dragon sticker. We definitely will be doing more dragon stickers. Everybody loves the two dragon stickers. Mm. We need... Uh, dragons are cool. Yeah. Um, what pen should the dragons be holding? We did Lamy 2000 and, well, something very much like a Lamy 2000, something very much like Inspired. a Lamy Safari. Yeah. Uh, what should be next? Let me know mm. in the comments. What do you think the dragons should be either uh, guarding or loving or something else? The thing about dragons is you never really know when they're going to attack. So it's, uh, it's always a surprise. Is that a pun or... It's just a fact about dragons. Oh. Do you ever see a dragon coming? I never see it coming. Never see it going either. I don't know. Is it even here? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Sarah sent us a picture. It didn't write in a comment, but sent us a picture of uh, their pilot varsity from 1990. Why is this a big deal, you might ask? Wow. Because it was writing. What? It was writing. It was not writing amazingly well. It was a little dry. But it wasn't like terribly skippy or anything. 1990, this thing is still going. That's 23 years ago. I'm no, I'm, 33 years ago. I'm working. Wow, we re-recorded this intro and I still did the math wrong. Yeah, 33 years ago. Yeah, I <laughs> so I am older than 1990 and I'm still working 
more poorly than that pile of varsity <laughs> is. Is this still in the original like ink? Yeah, I don't think she Has refilled it. Been refilled? It. I mean, no. you can technically refill those. I don't think anybody actually does that though. But I mean, somebody does. Yeah. If you <laughs> if you doesn't. refill your pile of varsities, <laughs> comment below. Yeah. And you but will get cool factor points. I thought that was amazing. We've talked many That's times impressive. about the pilot varsity and how resilient that thing is. Sounds like I need to exclusively use varsities because I don't clean my pens. <laughs> you probably should. <laughs> um, all mm. right. And Snow Dragon, or Snow Dragon Ka, Snow Dragon K A. I don't know. Snow mm. Dragon. Snow, Snow Dragunka. There you go. Dragunka. Uh, I, <laughs> they say, I came back to using fountain pens when I got more into my other hobby, board games. I have a terrible memory, and to remember all of the rules, I like to write rules summaries by hand. The act of writing physically cool. helps me remember much more than when I'm simply reading or writing digitally, and fountain pens are amazing for writing by hand. I completely agree with you. I yeah. love writing just for memory's sake. We answered a question a couple of weeks ago when Adrian was here, Brian, about mm -hmm. someone just asked, like, hey, I love to write, but what do I write? Um, yeah. I, rec I recommend, like, writing letters, and even if, like, it's sure, just a, like a rec uh, a practice letter just to kind of get out some opinions and emotions. Mm. But I did not mention that it's helpful just to take random notes on random things for memory's oh, yeah. sake, but that is immensely helpful. Yeah, definitely. Like I, that's what I use my pens for the most. I think mm -hmm. like I do some like really intentional writing, but that's fewer yeah. and farther between yeah. than just jotting down notes and reminders and, you know, talking mm -hmm. points and takeaways and yeah. stuff. I just want to stay in there because I feel like if I write it down, I'm like putting a little bit like a layer of lacquer over my memories. Yeah. Whereas if like I'm just it in. Yeah, it really mm -hmm. it does not always, but it definitely mm. helps. Yeah. It definitely for, helps. For me it's like a it's like a a filter. It like helps sift through the random thoughts that might pop out in my head. Oh. If, if I'm taking notes too much stream of conscious, like yeah. typing it out, it it doesn't filter out enough and I end up with just an overwhelming amount of stuff and it wanders a lot. Yeah, it's almost like a uh, yeah. a um you're almost like dictating rather yeah. than hitting it just, the it's high sort points. of just like flows through my head. Yeah, you don't want a transcript. No, not really. And there's like AI tools that can you do that cliff even notes. better anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I am physically writing by hand, it slows me down enough to where I have to summarize. I have to actually process Compress. what I'm hearing and then organize it. I do a lot of, like when I'm taking notes while somebody's talking, I do a ton of like bullet points mm -hmm. because that just, that format just works well for me. Um, so like a couple of weeks ago when I went to my little e-commerce conference thing, you know, as I'm hearing other talks from people, I am bulleting out everything um, and then putting stars and little shorthand notes and stuff that, you know, I guess technically I could do that while typing out. But if I was typing, I would be much more inclined to try to dictate everything. And then it would be so many notes I wouldn't necessarily go back through. And so it's really helpful. And in fact, I just recall like reading a article that I saw from the Washington Post earlier this week that was talking about just this point where if you're writing things down, it helps you to remember it more. Oh yeah. Not just because of the summarizing thing, but just something about the act of writing like using your hand, it engages more of your brain. Um, and I definitely find that to be true too. And it talks about how like college students who are writing by hand tend to score better on tests than those who are just dictating on a laptop. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. To yeah, think and about we both thing. have pretty garbage memories and so it definitely helps. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. We're, we're, we're really good at remembering certain things that don't matter so much. Yes. And then we forget some more important things, but. Yes. And with me, I've been, I've been going through some therapy lately and found it to be like absolutely a crucial part of the process for me as soon as I'm done with the therapy and I'm like my mind is kind of spinning and I'm thinking through what I've just talked about I like go out in my car and I like drive and like park over on the side so the sun's not in my eyes because I go in the morning and I will pull out my notebook and I will just write and I found that to be like so crucial I have to like schedule time to do that and I will use that as part of my therapeutic process to so you'll like go out. to a specific parking spot just for yeah the note the like yeah. the decompression yeah because like my therapist's office where i end up parking it's like eight o'clock in the morning the sun is shining like right into my window where i park there because that's where the door to the front of the building is so when i get out i don't want like the sun beating down on me and that's like you know there's usually like landscapers and stuff that are mowing and have leaf blowers and stuff. And that's not exactly like conducive to thinking, but so, but I don't want to go driving like all the way to the office or, you know, home or whatever. Cause it's like, by the time I start driving through and then I'm listening to music oh. or whatever, I forget yeah, no, whatever's on my mind. So it's like, I have to like sort of hold it in my brain and like, okay, let me drive over. And I like kind of sneak over to this like hidden part of the parking lot. That's like in the shade and stuff like that. Does and your therapist know that you do that? 
I mentioned like yeah, absolutely. Because like that that is that Not is like that specific of a process. Like, but. but therapists so desperately want patients to be mindful to like and to really do pe- some work outside yeah, like, of the thing. That yeah, is amazing. There, there's at least one therapist listening right now that's like, oh, thank God yes. for the you know patients like that. Like, yes, they, yeah, they, you, you are a good patient, Brian. Oh, thank you. Jim. I'm certain you are. I'm trying. I'm sure I'm they trying. appreciate that very yeah. much. Well, I'm a human living in this world right now, so therapy is part of how I cope with some of that. Hundred percent. But yeah, I'm looking. I'm digging through stuff on my past. I'm. I'm. I'm really getting into all kinds well, of fun stuff. Yeah. Well, you. Yeah. I mean, that, that's like. <laughs> You're you're gonna you, you get out what you put in, yeah. But also, putting in, in terms of therapy, is absolutely exhausting. It's really exhausting. Yeah, emotionally you for know, sure. So like for yeah, sure. like you you will. But it's really you'll eventually too. yeah you'll eventually get the better takeaways. For but sure. man, it for sure. Whew. I think I'm on the other getting on the other side of it now. I'm good. still like finding things, of course. Good, I'm good. doing EMDR therapy. If y'all know anything about that, but so that's really fun. But um, yeah, it's been it's been a process. Awesome. I'll say for a while I was like digging like down like further and further into my issues, and yeah. I was like, oh, this is not fun. Yeah. Well, that's where <laughs> that's where a lot of people <laughs> run away frightened. You know, yeah, and makes sense. That that's but it's, it's like physical therapy, but for your emotions. Exactly, because that that's when you when you when you start working out, <laughs> and you know if you quit when it starts to when you start to feel the burn. Yeah. Then you don't actually get that. That's that's when result. you that's when you start getting yes. the result and doing the work. While, that's when I, that's when while I, it's burning. That's when you're building the muscle. Yeah, see that, that's yeah. when I that's when I stop moving. I'm like, yeah, nope, right. <laughs> time to lay down. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It's not pleasant, but yeah. So anyway, writing is a very integral part of I would that, much like, rather genuinely yeah I would much rather mentally exercise than physically exercise 100% See, I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I, I would I, I don't know but I would much I rather like be completely broken down shattered and crying because of emotional revelation yeah. than be hot and sweaty <laughs> 100% wow, that's, that's that's dedication right there that's dedication <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Uh, I got some feedback here from Jane saying, I love the tangents, much like we just had. Good. (laughs) uh, Because I relate to them a lot. Chats about retro games, Bloons Tower Defense, Waffle House, Bojangles, the 90s, Shopping at Bygones, and Virginia's Humidity and Bugs all make me smile. I burst out laughing when Drew said, it's bow time in one of the recent episodes. Uh, it'll be bow time for us on Friday. We're doing a little lunch and learn. Me, Drew, and Janae. I'm going to watch some videos and, you know, educate ourselves while we eat biscuits. Uh, the pencast effectively makes me want to move back to Virginia while also making me relieved that I do not live there anymore because I cannot stand the bugs and humidity. Haha. <laughs> I enjoy Brian's deep dives because I get to learn something I often know little to nothing about. Sorry, Drew. That was not me saying sorry. That was Jane, but, you know. You can say sorry, too. I'm not sorry, though. <laughs> I got to be honest. <laughs> I know. Uh, but Drew loads the questions into the outline, so he kind of knows what he's getting into at this point. Sometimes I do. Sometimes, sometimes. I don't. Sometimes <laughs> Sometimes I'm I like, don't. Sometimes, sometimes like, okay, <laughs> pick a favorite thing. <laughs> well, well, it depends. Yeah. Uh, let's think of this hypothetical scenario. What do you mean thing? Yeah, I... I surprise myself sometimes with where I can go diving mm-hmm. into a very shallow pool, but I still find a way. Um, Paul says, I'm a big fan of your work. Your pen casts are enjoyable, and I find your 101 fountain pen review videos incredibly useful. I also appreciate your insights into the fountain pen world's inner workings and your thoughts on leadership, team member development, and team building. Hats off to you and your teams for your great work. Keep it up. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. I'm just keep that good feedback coming that's filling my tank man love it uh and then michael medlinger says yes john philip sousa did indeed invent the sousa phone ah. so that marching bands would have a tuba that was practical to carry around how about that now we know you well think? you suspected you mentioned that like i suspected probably. how would i know i only marched it for two years you I probably you know. probably did learn it. you just forgot it ah uh, probably it was in college and there was a lot going on i was there's a lot of information coming at me at that time, and I don't think I retained a significant portion of it. But I don't remember anything from my so-called higher education. <laughs> yeah, I not mean, a that thing. That was a long time ago. At this Zero. Point, that was, I think, maybe more than half our life ago at this point. I mean, I don't know if I remember anything from high school or anything from after high school. Yeah. I mean, wh- how would I know? How would you know? I don't, yeah. It's in your head. I don't know. Yeah. Look at pictures. I don't know where anything, I don't know how anything got there. 
<laughs> I mean, naturally over time, you're going to forget most of the like day-to-day -day stuff. I took, I took, I took things. survey of Western arts. I couldn't tell you one thing about that class. You probably should have taken notes by hand. That would have helped you uh, retain better. Drew. I did. Oh. I didn't have a computer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. This was, this was 2003, <laughs> man. I, 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 had a, a, I had a computer, but I didn't have a laptop. No, I didn't have I had a like laptop. a compact computer. I had an e-machines at Ooh, that time. Ooh, I had yeah. an e-machines at one point as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, Gateway, you know, yep. all those computers from yep. the early 2000s. Gotta love it. All right, uh, that's it for feedback that we've got. Um, but before we do, Drew, I gotta share with you, you know, it's, we're having very volatile temperatures this time of year. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like when we had Halloween last week, it was like 82 degrees the day before Halloween. And then I think it was like 45 degrees when we were actually trick-or-treating yes, on Halloween. Yes, got way cold. Or yeah, we're, we're, get, we're getting way thrown off. But, uh, you know, I've talked before about what I thought would be the most ideal piece of clothing, you know, for such such temperatures cargo, when you want cargo shorts you want to be warm well that's a given anytime <laughs> uh no i wanted a piece of clothing that could keep my core warm oh you're talking about but the, yet still have ventilation the sleeveless yeah well zip I, up hoodie so i was visiting my in-laws uh, a couple weekends ago and i found did you find one such an article of clothing for myself ellie has one and so i was like it exists but i found one and did you get one I you got, got one. one i bought it with my own money <laughs> Not a business expense. This is a personal expense. Um, oh my God. And it's brown. It's a nice color. For your sake. They had a green one too that looked really good, but they didn't have my size because I'm a big no, boy. No, this is, this is what you need. Um, but it is wow. fle fleece lined, padded. Uh, not too padded though. It's not like, it's not like poofy. Vest, it's hoodie vest. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is marvelous. Even though I'm already wearing a hoodie, I'm going to put this on anyway. Double, double hoodie. Double hoodie. Yeah. You just can't have enough. Okay. And it like, Kind of goes like, yeah like very green. earthy yeah i'm very like hikeable right now and the best part these pockets are like no joke they're like the whole thing here is pockets i can take my giant water bottle and like <laughs> fit the whole thing in there this how much is this for me drew that is very you so you need you there. need like multiples can, of these with my with my super long arms i can keep my sleeves hiked like yes. this like you know we do uh -huh. and i can still fit like my whole forearm in <laughs> there for like maximum coverage it's perfect oh my god like i'm ready for a bonfire man let's that do it that is amazing so that is awesome loving it i love hoods got it at marshall's i dude i get it's, most everybody's always what's, asking me like what's, what, the, what's the brand i forget what brand it is weather like, weatherproof weatherproof vintage or something yeah. like that I don't know. I don't know what people, weatherproof means. People always ask me where I get my shirts from. More than half of them come from Marshalls or TJ Maxx. You never know yeah. what you're going to get. And in they're all twelve ninety nine. Like nice. so many of them. It's this great. one's not. I got this one. I got this one for in, in some more of the like really pizzazzy ones from a website called um, supermassiveshop.com. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, but well, uh, most of them come from Marshalls. I got a couple from nice. like the Hot Topic website, the ones with cor okay. corgis. They, those came from Hot Topic. I've had good luck there in like TJ Maxx and Burlington Coat Factory. Yeah. They carry, I'm a big guy, so they carry some of the weirder sizes mm -hmm. that tend to fit me better. Some, sometimes the weirder size things have the coolest offerings. Like in I the know, medium zone. Because they it, don't sell at regular yeah. stores. Well, so then in they the end medium up in zone, everything's all picked through. I'll like find something in the XL. I'm like, oh, cool. And then I'll go over to mediums. Like, no, nope, not there. No, no. Because too many, too many mediums. Not nothing. Not nothing. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. All right. Pretty best. That is, that is. Loving it. I'm so glad you actually bought that and didn't just I like did. see it and I own took it. a picture of it. Oh, I wore it out of the store. Did you really? Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. I'm so into that. That's fantastic. And I, and I wore it back. Rachel didn't even know. Like we were going to get like groceries or something like that. My, me and my brother-in-law. And we went in there. He bought a nice flannel shirt and everything. We were like, we, we were doing good at, nice. at Marshall's. <laughs> and then uh, <clears throat> I walked back in with the groceries wearing this and I just didn't say anything to Rachel and she busted out laughing. She was like, I can't believe you bought that. And I was like, I legitimately am enjoying wearing this thing, though it is a little warm with the double hoodie thing, but you're just keeping your core. I look so good. I'm yeah. just gonna keep it going. So that's fantastic. Please anyway, do. I thought you'd appreciate that. I absolutely do. <laughs> All right, cool. That's what we got for feedback. Uh let's talk about some new stuff, shall we? All right, Drew. We got a new Tatcha Empress Chink and Fountain Pen called the Owl. We do. You would be wise to check out this pen. <laughs> Sorry, that was terrible. Uh. Um, this is a limited edition. This is part of Tatcha's 20 for 20, 20 pens for 20 years. And they're making 20 of them, 20, 20, 20. And uh, if you're not familiar with the process of chinking, it's 
very time consuming because it's all done by hand. It's layers of Yurushi lacquer. And then it's like this kind of stippling, like engraving technique where it's just like little scoops, little tiny little scoops. Yeah. Um, and then it's backfilled with uh, gold powder or uh, in this case, I don't know what kind of magical stuff they're using, but there's gold, but there's also these like lavender type. I don't know if it's lavender, but some kind of plant that's like green and purple. But it's like colored in the chicken stippling. It's I don't know how they do it, but it looks amazing. It you does. don't see colored chicken like ever. Um, and they're doing it and it looks amazing. So it's $4,300. There's only 20 of them in the world. So if you're not serious about, <clears throat> excuse me, got a little iced coffee building up in the throat there. Uh, even if you're not actually thinking about buying this thing, you got to go check it out because it's a very cool looking pen. Yeah, take t take a look at least at the really close up images because when you see a chinkin pen, it's hard to appreciate it until you see the actual etches in the urushi lacquer yeah that's when you know you can see that someone by hand took those notches out and you just get an appreciation for just how many you know thousands of little cuts yeah. make up that beautiful design yeah and you can think of somebody sitting there for like hours and hours and hours like tink 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 just a little bit and if they screw it up you got to throw it out you can't it's like seeing it. brush strokes it's like wow a hand it's made impressive. every single one it's of impressive. those strokes yeah, it's very cool. Um, and then I got a couple of Esterbrook uh, sleeve pen pen things to talk about here. So the Esterbrook canvas single pen sleeve. So this is in magenta. It's a limited edition, kind of a pink, kind of a magenta. A little more on the pink side than on the purple side, but it's a limited edition. They did it for Fountain Pen Day, which is cool because Carrie Yeager, who's basically the guy behind Fountain Pen Day, uh, works at Kenro, who owns Esterbrook. So it's like a nice little full circle. Um, and then uh, it's $17.95 for that. I don't know how long they're going to have them. I don't know how many they made, but since it's for Fountain Pen Day, I imagine it's not going to be like a ton. Like once they sell out, they're going to be gone. Um, and then same thing for the Esterbrook To Go Pen Cup, which is a cool little, bucket. you know, a little bundle, a little bunching sock of, bucket. of pens. So sock bucket. Yeah. There you go. That's just a it's not inaccurate as to what it is. Um, so yeah, it's got like individual little slots for the pens, kind of like how a pen wrap would kind of like have them all clumped together, except it doesn't like roll out. It's got flaps. Hold on, you did flaps this? That, you did flaps this? That, I don't know. I'm literally just talking and my hands are doing things. I don't even know what I'm- <laughs> What is this? What, I'm, what is that? I don't know what I just did. I don't know. Take it for what you will. It's interpretive. Um, but anyway, you can like fold down. I'm like sit on my hands now. You can fold down the flaps on the to-go cup and you can have the pens just standing up on your desk. Yes, just like that. Um, and then you can you can roll them up and carry them with you and they're protected. And they're pretty cool and it's also magenta and it has a Fountain Pen Day logo and it's limited edition and it's $59.95. Your turn, Drew. <laughs> Brian cannot talk without his hands. <laughs> I really can't. No, you I can't. I really can't. When I was a kid, I probably have told this before. When I was a kid, my dad would drive me to preschool and he, because it was the 80s, wore white pants and would have an open coffee mug oh God. in the morning. And I would flail my hands around. And on many occasions, I would- Many? Many, which as a kid, I am look back I look back at it now and I'm like, this isn't me as a kid's fault. This was his fault. He was the dad. <laughs> he kept having the open coffee cup and holding it in his right hand, allowing me to thus hit it with my gesticulation and knocking coffee onto his white pants. It happened many times. Well, it, the white, the frequent <laughs> use of white pants is its own little thing. It was the I 80s. I feel like I don't know when travel mugs became a thing because I remember yeah. in, in, in the 80s, I remember my parents having, instead of travel mugs with any sort of lid attached to them, yeah. there was a normal size spout yeah. But then it flared like out. Like a flat bottom. Yeah. Massively flared out so that all the splashing would happen in this kind of like yeah. large flat it retains, bottom. Retains heat better too. Reservoir. Yeah. So yeah. Like, I think that was like the travel mug. But you can't like, obviously you can't put that in a cup holder or anything. No, it just needs to sit on the dash or yeah. next to the seat or something like that. I don't know. But um, we also that, had like this vo beater Volkswagen Quantum. I don't even know if it had cup holders. Volkswagen so, Quantum? Yeah. I've never even heard of it. I don't know cars, but still. I don't know. But like it was that, kind of a pile. My Both my parents had that style of thing. I didn't see a travel mug with like a lid, like a twisty lid thing until the 90s. But maybe maybe we just didn't have them. I don't know. I don't know when the travel mug was invented. You want to see Volkswagen Quantum? It was brown too. There you go. Well, that's beautiful. That's Volkswagen Quantum. That these, is, are all, these are all wagons. I don't think is, ours was a wagon. 
Yeah, but then he had that like 80s. Anyway, Google it. It's ugly. But then he had that like 80s Mercedes for a while too. Like your dad has a style. That was a few years ago. Yeah. 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 He likes the- uh, He's he likes, got an eclectic He likes taste. the boxy cars. He does. Yeah, he's got, he's got an interesting taste in cars. Um, All right. Anyway. So we've also got new, um, a new shown design Pocket 6. So in the past, we have mm. had two different limited-ish edition pens. They're exclusive, but not really. They're, but they're for sale on his site if you want to go grab them there. Um, but we just wanted to have at least something ongoing. So we are going to start carrying a satin black Shown Design Pocket 6 for $135, multiple nib sizes, but it will be available ongoing. So it will not be a limited situation, but you'll be able to get a Pocket 6 here whenever you want to. Um, so yay, yay for that. That's cool. Um, always happy to have any and all of Ian's yeah. stuff on our website. He's a Definitely. great guy, runs a great company, Super. makes a great pen. Yeah. And then we've got a bunch of Ferris wheel press, press stuff, Brian. Yeah, So I see first that. off, we've got the Ferris wheel press Crystal Blue Legacy. This is mm. their annual edition for 2024. It's not it, 2024 yet. Though. It says 2024 on our website. Okay. So I guess it's I'm like. I assume that's right. I, like it's a, like a car model yeah. that like comes out the year before. I guess so. Which confuses me when it's like July and they're coming out with 2024 cars. I'm like, what? Yeah. What is this? So, but anyway, it's their annual edition. <laughs> it's Crystal Blue Legacy. It is blue. It has blue shimmer mm. and it is $22 for the uh, 38 mil bottle, the larger bottle. Yeah. Speaking of the larger bottle, they are also kind of pairing this, you know, with mm -hmm. an optional purchase of a $40 ink carriage, which is the kind of. Mm. Uh, Bracket stand stand. Yeah. What, what's the what's the, what's the part of the Ferris wheel that's in the middle? What would you call that? The support structure. I don't know. I don't anyway, know if it has like official name. I'm sure it has. The an official bottle name. goes into it, and it looks like the round part of the Ferris wheel, and then the ink carriage is the support structure, the beams or whatever. Trell tre tre trellis? No, trestle. Trestle? What's a trestle? Trestle is like. If you have a table that's got like a big beam going across the bottom yeah. like that connects the legs, I don't know what that's I'm a trestle, about. I think. All right. Well, anyway, we've had them before in gold. They sold really well. So this one is silver. Again, it's $40. You can get it if you want to add some extra stabilization to your Ferris wheel press 38 mil bottle filling experience because they can be a little bit wobbly. Um, what is uh, not really big and wobbly is the smaller uh, fairy tales inks. So those are 20 mil and they are $20, but the smaller, more orb-like bottles. In this case, I'm talking about Sugar and Spite. That is a smaller bottle, but it packs a wallop because this ink has purple and pink ink, okay, with duochrome pink and gold sparkle. That's a lot happening right there. Purple, pink ink, which you could say magenta, right? Sure. Isn't that purple, pink? Yeah. All right, Ferris Wheel Press says purple, pink ink with duochrome pink and gold sparkle. I'm trying to find what these things are called on the Ferris Wheel. Yeah, I don't know. Supports. Supports. Is what I'm seeing. There we go. But that's all the Ferris Wheel Press stuff, and that does it for the new stuff. Brian, you want to A some Qs? I think we can Q some A's. No, A some Qs. Yeah. That's their job to. You guys got to Q the Qs, and we got to A the A's. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. All right. Okay. True. We're going to kick things off with our friend Jane. Hello, Jane. Hi, Jane. Jane's asking us, A, this is a twofer, ah. and, but they're pretty simple twofers. Enjoy my mess. Uh, yeah, here. looking good. All right. Jane is saying, would you provide tips on how to flush pilot pens? Pretty simple answer there. I know you got an mm -hmm. answer for that. I, I, think mm -hmm. I, know, I think I know what it is. I got tips. Um, and then the second part of Jane's question is, will there be a Goulet exclusive Sailor Pro Gear and Pro Gear Slim in 2024? These are great questions. Yeah, but, but not not super complicated. Unless no, you no, no. These are, it no, doesn't look can, like you deep, deep dived can, on this one somehow. I didn't. Good. I shallow dived on these ones. They're more like belly Good. flopped. Excellent. Um, which is what happens when I try to dive in real life. Um, so bulb syringe. Uh, it's kind of tough to use a regular bulb syringe with most pilot pens because they have this like post like kind of thing that wraps around the back of the feed yeah and it makes it difficult to like fit i've done it with like very bound determination to use a regular bulb syringe with a pilot pen but you have to like really kind of want it and you have to sort of like cup your hand around it and that's what i like do. sort of like yeah use that as a as some sort of like uh what's the word like a band or whatever there's like a 
thing when you're trying to connect two different like pipes and you like wrap it with something. Ah, I can't okay. remember the word. But whatever, you gotta like, water is definitely gonna go places. You just gotta like, like contain it with your hand. Yeah. It's not a pretty process, but um, it can be done in a pinch. It's not what I recommend though. If you're gonna be cleaning a lot of pilot pens or if you have several pens and you'd like to use them and clean ink all the time, uh, I think it's better to dedicate an entire bulb syringe just for that purpose. Um, not even just Pilot. There's other pens too that it, this is more helpful. I think specifically like the Sailor King of pens. There's just a lot happening on the back of that grip. And, and there's, there's holes in that thing There's metal, too, there's right? holes. Yeah. You can't reuse a bulb, regular bulb syringe on that one very easily either. Um, so what you do is you cut off about an inch of the end of that bulb syringe. Obviously, it's then dedicated for that purpose at this point. But then instead of trying to put it on the inside of the grip and flushing it that way, you're now putting it all like on the outside and then you can flush it through. Little pro tip here though, even though when you do that, it can sort of like hold. What does it sound like when you do the, that? Like, oh, just like that. <laughs> You'll think of that every time you go to do that now. Um, every time you do that, it's gonna hold on to the grip and it's gonna feel pretty secure. But if you're pressing on the bulb syringe, you're, you're putting pressure on it and you could inadvertently like blast that tip out, out of there and, and, and the grip and the nib and all that and you could have some damage. Um, so you don't wanna, you don't wanna tempt fate. It's still good to hold the grip as you're flushing it, even though it's like gripping onto the, to the back of that thing. So um, I find that to be incredibly helpful. And I think it's, you know, as far as exactly how much you cut, I would start with like less than you think you're gonna need. And if it feels too tight, cut off a little bit more because you can always take off more, but you can't put it back. Um, but anyway, so I find that to be super helpful. And I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. Agreed. All right, and then will there be a Gula exclusive sailor in 2024? Um, as of right now, we don't have any plans, but not to say we couldn't. The, yeah. op the option's open. Um, we we have minimums that we have to meet, and so there has to be like a certain amount of demand. We have to feel like we have something that's interesting and compelling enough to do it for you all. Um, and Sailor's come out with so many new pens in the last couple of years that some of it was like we, we had ideas and we're like, I don't really know what we could do that's like not sort of already represented in, in a current offering. So, um, you know, we're open to ideas and we're not even at the time where it's like too late to do it, but we're definitely not gonna have anything the first half of the year. Um, so we'll have to kind of see, but you know, if you have ideas and wanna leave it in the comments, let us Actually, know. Actually, I already asked everybody. Oh, you did? I did, they all like overwhelmingly, probably 470 some oh. said uh, Stealth Brown. Stealth brown or or uh, northern skies brown. Uh, uh, oh, brow. Oh, nor to keep with our northern lights. Mm -hmm. The theme, we can go the with theme that we currently have already yeah. had. Yeah, yeah. Northern lights brown. That's yeah. It's funny because yeah. I don't recall seeing any of those comments. Well, I deleted it. It got um, it got to be too much. Oh, you deleted the overwhelmingly positive response yeah. that people felt about that? Okay, yeah, it was, that, that uh, seems like an interesting choice. Well, it was hard because like, you know, I go into YouTube and I look at all the comments and I answer them. Right. It was just oversaturated with pro brown. It was just too much. Yeah. So it was just blocking out all the other comments. Yeah. And then I couldn't support the other customers. Oh, who, yeah, well, that's very selfish of you to think yeah. about that then. Okay, You're so welcome. there's so there's a, a, a secret uh, groundswell of demand for this thing that I won't see online. It's in the streets, but it's out yeah. there. You go out, okay. on, you got to go okay. out in the streets, Brian. You'll in, hear into it. the streets. You'll hear it in the streets. I'll hear it <laughs> proclaimed in the streets. We want <laughs> Northern Lights brown, yes, brown sparkles. Wow, <laughs> what would that even look like? Like, I mean, because like the Northern Lights we've done have been like one color in the body, and then the finials are. But another what color? happened to the Northern Lights when, when the, there's like some massive sewage leak? You oh, know, or like when, a wildfire or something yeah. that like the wildfire smoke is like, you know, yeah, yes. blocking the view of this. So like, know. like a brown and dark orange kind of a vibe. Maybe is that kind of what you're thinking? I don't, kind of I don't. This isn't my thing. Oh, just, this is not your. <laughs> don't not don't your ask idea. me. I am. I am but a. Right. I okay. am but. All right. Let's. Uh, you know, I am but an emissary for the will of the people, Brian. There's no such thing as bad ideas in brainstorming, Drew, so I'll take that into consideration and we All can right. we can talk about I'll, it. I'll let them know. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you for being the harbinger of uh, the, the people here. I'll do my best. Okay, um, cool. Well, Drew, I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. This one comes from Greg. Hey, Greg. So get ready. I own a Pilot Custom 823 and love it. Would buying a next level pen, like a Pilot Custom 845, Sailor King of Pens, Visconti Homo Sapiens, be worth the five to six hundred dollar jump in price. Is the writing experience that much better? No, 
Greg, the writing experience <laughs> is not five hundred dollars more better yeah. than the A twenty three. That's a truth bomb right there, Drew. Yeah, Dang. no, I mean, no, you agree. Like, if if is is the writing hundred? No, it's totally worth it every time. Not no, the it's... writing experience. It, it, every all of the value past that point. The A twenty three does kind of sit in a really cool zone as far as kind of where. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of folks, myself included, think that kind of the nib experience maybe doesn't peak, but reaches a pretty definable plateau in terms of how things have gone up and up and up. As you buy a more expensive pen, you're getting better nib quality. Right around the 823 zone um, is where, you know, you see a nice peak. Honestly, a lot of those Pilot Gold nibs is where it peaks, honestly. Um, nib size is kind of a preference to that point. But yeah. Um, after that, it slows down. And then you stop paying for writing enhancements and you mm. start paying for aesthetic enhancements and or build enhancements or build features, things that are simply harder to put together, you know, build quality, things like that. Mm. So with the Homo sapiens, as you mentioned, Greg, that you're paying for the fact that it's made out of a very, very unique material that no other fountain pen is made out of. There simply is not another fountain pen other than the Homo sapiens that's made from, you know, volcanic resin. So there you go. If you want that, you're paying for mm-hmm. it. With the 845, it's made of a Rushi. So you are going to be paying a premium for that labor intensive process. It's mm-hmm. going to write not unlike the 823. It's a bigger nib, but, it, you know, as far as how the tipping material is finished off, probably the identical process as the 823. So... If you're looking, if you just want a better writing experience than the 823 and that's what you want to pay for, I would say don't. Instead, take, you know, something similar to an 823 and send it to a nib technician to get made better or get to be made perfect to your specifications if the writing experience is what you're after. Granted, you could go, you know, the Visconti route and do both. You could get a nice lava pen and then send it off to get that perfect nib. But don't expect any pen that's five hundred dollars more than an eight twenty three to be five hundred times better when it comes to putting the nib on the paper. I had to look this up because I wanted to double check because Pilot has a lot of nibs. The A forty five has a numbered fifteen size nib, same size as the custom eight twenty three. Actually, is it really? Yeah, the custom Urushi is bigger. That's the yeah, number that's 30 way size. bigger. Yeah, but no, the A forty five is a number fifteen nib. It's How about literally that? Literally the same. So, nib. It looks different. It's got the two tone. It yeah. looks pretty cool. Um, but in terms of how it's going to write, it's going to be identical, identical to the A23. So you're literally not paying anything for the additional writing experience. Yeah. Unless, you know, kind of like Drew's mentioning with Homo sapiens, for me, like the nib and the feed are obviously a massively important part of the writing experience. But also for me, like the size of the pen, the material it's made of, like for me, I have very oily, kind of sweaty hands. So using a Homo sapiens with that material, it's... It, tends to absorb a little more moisture. I get a better grip on a pen like that than I do on a resin pen. So for me, part of the writing experience is influenced by the material that it's made of and the weight and the balance and things like that. So, you know, but it's not like a hard, fast rule that spending more money will make that a better experience. You get a lot more factors. And like like Drew said, it's kind of a lot of things outside of just the nib and yeah. stuff like that. Well, that, like a watch, come into play. you know, you can buy, you know, a a $2 watch versus a $50 watch mm. you're probably the, you're probably going to see a pretty sizable increase in yeah. operation and physical quality yeah and but then you go from a $50 watch to a $100 watch probably not that much maybe not it, it, a $50 watch is probably not going to tell time worse than a $100 watch no, not at all. but you are going to get a better quality product. You're going to get a better band. It's going to feel better. Maybe it'll last longer. Maybe it'll be more resilient. But yeah. you start paying for different things. You're no longer paying. I, I'm, this is probably not the price point. I'm not a watch guy, but I don't know what that price point is. But I'm sure there's a price point where the actual telling of time stops improving. Oh, it's and probably then, these days, like any quartz mechanism tells time more accurately than yeah, even like a $20,000 mechanical watch so at that like, point you're paying for completely <laughs> different things yeah exactly exactly so That's it just really depends on what you value greg if you mm-hmm. value that material aspect if you want mm-hmm. something a little bit more labor intensive or maybe you just want to spend more money to get something that's unique to you or a material that you that has a lot of swirls in it that you know is not exactly replicated anywhere else 
what you value should, you know, in, uh, should, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Should. Yeah. But be reflected in the price you're going to yeah, pay. Yeah. It should be yeah. reflected yeah. in the price you're going to pay for sure. rather than just you seeking out enhanced nib experience. The way, Absolutely. if you want a better nib, you know, send it to a professional and they can make it perfect. That's but, true. Uh, Any gold nib, especially if you have it tuned is going to be pretty comparable to most other gold nib bends. Yep. You know, so, but yeah. All right. Stuff to think about. You pretty much covered everything I was going to say, but cool. Um, I will say the the king of pens has like kind of softness to it. Yeah, that is that is cool. But you know, you kind of I, for me when you get to the really expensive, like you can spend more on nibs and get. I'm not going to say like a universally better nib, but you can get more specialized nibs that require a lot more handwork and special grinds and things like that. So you have to go down more like specific paths to continue to add that value just by paying more. Um, but as like a general rule, it kind of supports by what you're saying. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. Next one is from Serendipity. Mm. And we've got a hypothetical for you, Brian. Okay, I'm ready. The day has finally come. Ellie mm. is forcing Brian to retire and taking oh. over the Goulet Pen Company. Okay. She's told him he has to leave behind his portion of the immense collection that he's always made clear was for, quote unquote, mm. historical reference. Am I being like shipped off to some island or something? Uh, unclear. <laughs> but Am I she being is exiled a, like Napoleon here? Yes, okay. going to Elba. All right. Um, or as Ellie, she would probably rename it. Um, <laughs> But she is allowing you to take any and all of your pens that you can tr that you truly consider to be your personal pens. In this hypothetical, I'm I'm grateful that I get a say in what is being considered. Look at that. These She's pens. a benevolent dictator. <clears throat> <laughs> Under these conditions, where he no longer needs all of the pens as reference, mm. what pens will be taken home forever, and what pens will be left behind as property of the new regime of the Goulet Pen Company? Mm. How many pens would be in Brian's remaining personal collection? There's no limits on how many or restrictions on value. Mm. But if Rachel would limit the number of pens for space reasons, that should be taken into consideration. Oh, boy. Okay. There's a lot of factors here. Well, they know you. take into account. You, you have... This This is what serendipity has to do because they've mm. actually they've listened to this pencast quite a few times and they know what, uh, what you're going to try to do. I think it was Oprah that said that you teach people how to treat you and... <laughs> I feel like that's playing out here in this hypothetical that has yes. got very some strict yes, boundaries, but yes, little do is. you know, I have no end to my squirreliness and how I want to get around hypotheticals. I think we know that too. Um, this is a this is a very interesting question. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, we're kind of joking. I love my daughter, and she's not going to likely stage a coup. I'm, I'm not nine. I'm not 100 percent certain, but. 98% certain that that's not going to happen? Well, she's forcing you to retire. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you need to retire. Maybe you, you've hung on too long. I'm, hung on, uh, I'm, maybe getting, you're just I'm getting so senile trouble that and, I'm just constantly yeah. saying wrong information yeah. in, without realizing it. Um, uh, so my, my more realistic situation is uh, I don't know that she would force me to retire. She might still find me useful, like maybe installing me as some sort of puppet. Um, and she could just kind of pull my strings from behind the scenes, but then I can be sort of a lightning rod for criticism Ooh, when good. something goes wrong. Um, I could see that maybe playing That's out good. as a scenario. Uh, or she'd probably do with me what I think she'd probably do with you. Um, she'll just put both of us into like a room like this, and, right. you know, remove the memory card and right. just tell us that we're talking to our audience and we'll just end up talking into an, an, this an empty camera. This extemporaneous superfluous right. something right. else pen gas. Right. <laughs> yeah, I remember the 90s. Um, there's so much neon. Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, so she did force me out. She had the, the grace to let me choose which pens to take. Um, I think she'd let me keep all the wooden pens that I made oh, yeah, before, she don't want those. before the modern Goulet pens form. They're they're cool for historical purposes, but they don't they're not anything we carry. They're they're not particularly relevant except to my story of how I got into it. So, um, kind of the same thing with like random prototypes and artist proofs and things that you know are maybe duplicates with slight tweaks uh, to things, or it's prototypes we did that just never panned out into actual final products. Um, those aren't necessarily crucial to what needs to happen in the future, um, and they're never going to get used in videos really. Uh, all the random pens that I bought at pen shows, you know, strictly out of personal interest. So certain like vintage pens and, you know, ones from like independent makers like Ryan Krusak and Canalea, some other shown stuff, things like that, that I just like personally 
found an interest in, but don't necessarily have like relevancy per se to what we carry here. Um, I could see those not being something worth kind of hanging on to for her. I don't know. I wouldn't show her any of these pens just in case. Yeah, I would just hide them all. Yeah. Yeah. Because she might see the Candelay and the Crusac and be like, mm, That's no, true. She likes them. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. They are really cool. Um, any personal gift pens that I was given, especially if it's like with a brand that we don't carry. I have a couple of Montblancs and stuff that have been like gifted to me for various reasons. Yeah. Um, and then maybe the ones, if she's feeling very benevolent, uh, ones that are like iconic to my story, like my blue custom 74, my first Lamy 2000, you know, the ones that are like part of my journey yeah. that I talk about a lot. Um, that'd be kind of cool to get to hang on to those. Uh, I'm not sure about like the historical exclusives. Like part of the reason I do have a lot of pens is because basically every color, every version of exclusive that we do here, I keep one. Yeah. And that's like really, like really truly for historical reference. Um, I'm somewhat sentimental to all of them, but we have photos of them all. So I don't know if keeping the physical pens would be necessary in Ellie's regime. So I could see her letting me take those. Keep in mind, whatever I'm taking, she's like still in my family. So <laughs> she would still have access to all of them. Um, I don't think that she'd want to keep any of the Noodler's pens because of the smell. Oh yeah. So I could see her. Has she ever smelled a Noodler's pen? Um... That's a good question. I can't recall if she has or not. You should take home a Noodler's pen one day. get her reaction. Okay. Let your kids sniff it. Okay. You smell this okay. pen. Nothing bad is going to happen. I don't know. They're like preteen teenagers now, and there's some smells happening in the house that they're oblivious <laughs> to that I'm like, I don't know. I could be surprised by what they could tolerate because um, they could tolerate more than I can. I just hide one and like uh, uh, un unwrap one fresh from the plastic and just put it in their backpack. Put it back. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, she puts so much stuff in her backpack. She'll bring like 10 books to school. Like she's got, they, got, they have a laptop. They don't have textbooks anymore. Right. But just like recreational like, books. Yeah, just books. Yeah. She wants to, she's like, I want options. And I'm like, your book bag weighs like 40 pounds. That's like or more than like it me. would wear if more. She's than... like major. You know how much stuff I carry around. She's like me. She does the same thing. Yeah, and you were one of those students since I can remember mm -hmm. that had the big honking L.L. Bean back then. Yeah, with like the two sections uh -huh. on it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like you you had that thing before a lot of kids did. In high yep. school, you saw it happening more, but you had it early. I had a I have a I had an aunt who lived in Massachusetts that was like driving distance from the LL Bean. LL Bean, their return rate is like 45% or something crazy. So they have like their outlet stores. Did you have like your the, initials on it? Gonna, they weren't my initials. They were somebody else's initials. <gasps> really? It was like a reject backpack or a misprint or something <laughs> like that. I don't remember that. So that's part of why I I remember you it. had one. I don't remember the initials. Yeah, my, we didn't buy name brand stuff. It was like <laughs> part of the like super got a good deal kind of a backpack uh. situation. It was red. I didn't like that color per se, but it did kind of stand out. But it was, it was odd. Big freaking backpack. Oh, it was huge. And you we, had had to carry, we had to carry textbooks. Like we, I legitimately had like 30 pounds of books to carry around. But yeah, I would, but I didn't have that backpack and I had just as many books to carry around. That thing. I didn't like going to my locker in between classes. Oh. So I would just carry my books for the entire day. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. And then I would just carry a lot of other things. That thing was like wider than your torso. It was really big. Yeah. It was really big, you know? But I got a nice strong back now. So, you know, I'm not saying correlation is causation, but... <laughs> You know, read into it what you, you will. You need to get Ellie one of those. She has a pretty big backpack, and you need to get you it. you need to get her one of those Swiss ones like you have, and be like, Ellie, the day has come. You know, you 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 have earned hmm. the Goulet choice the Swiss gear. Yeah, backpack. backpack. She's got some blue thing. Her and Joseph actually have the same backpack. Mm. It's kind of confusing, but Great. that's what she chose. Anyway, um, I could see her being fairly generous. With some pens. I don't think space would be an issue because pens don't take up a lot of space in the grand scheme of things. Though I do have a lot of pens. At some point, they start to take up a yeah. lot of space. But, you know, I have tools. I have other things that take up a lot more space. And Rachel's very forgiving in that way. She I feel is. I like, feel like I could, you know, the hammers that I have probably take up as much space as the the pens that I, that oh I have. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It would probably be a few hundred pens at least. That you'd take? That I would take. Oh my God. I'm telling you, man, it really it really adds up when you start going through the whole oh, thing. Oh man. And it's just, I don't know, I, it's gonna be, I really don't wanna think about this. Like it's gonna be a <laughs> sad day when I have to like actually think about like winding things down for myself. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. By no, that time I'm gonna have like, I'm gonna have like 7,000 pens. No. All of them I will 
argue I have an emotional connection to yes. and Rachel will be like, Brian, yes. seriously, you have a problem. Yes. I'm, I'm going to be on some TV show and they're going to be like, we are dictated by the state to take the pens away out of your house. I will say you, you have gotten you better about <laughs> getting rid of things. I'm, I'm, Overall, I'm, I'm trying. Like I'm pen, trying. pen boxes, and yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you there yeah. was a time where you were keeping all of them. Well, it reaches a point where it's just ridiculous. I agree, but I'm like, I don't think you were aware of what that point was until you actually gave it. I'm saying I'm proud of you. You've you've come. You've Thank come, you. You've come I'm, away. I'm growing as a person. Like the the the, the ink uh, swatches we were talking about the other day. Yes. You were like, I don't think we need those. I don't think we need to keep those. And I was very proud of you. Thank you. Wait, did you? I'm growing. Oh, okay. No, I didn't do anything. You looked that. guilty for a second. I'm like, did you change your mind? Did you? No, no, no. <laughs> I was, I was specifically talking with BK about my story of, you know, we used to in the early days, we did swabs on white and then swabs on off white, so we yes. could see the difference. It turns out that no one cared about the off white, so we had hundreds of manual ink swabs that I had done on ivory paper, and it reached a point where Rachel was like, Brian, these. We're never gonna use these, no one cares, they need to go. And she actually threw them in the trash and I pulled them out of the trash can <laughs> and kept them. And then she found them later on. She's like, Brian, <laughs> what are these? And I was like, well, I, it took a long time to do them and I, I don't know, maybe we'll, and she was like, no, seriously. And I was like, okay. Oh. I didn't throw them out though. They got, they got thrown out, they got thrown out. But you did behind, you know, I was aware that it was happening. Oh my God. I will have that sometimes where I'm just like, I know that this stuff needs to go. Or like, there's this pile of things over here that need to be gone through and, yeah. and thrown out. I'm like, I'm not going to be the one yes. to be able to do that. I'm the guy to throw things away. You, you've you given me that authority before. Shannon gives me that authority. She's like, I can't, I she, she, she's had gifts before that like, you know, somebody has given her. And she wants to keep it because she feels like it'd be impolite not to not keep it. Sure. And she's told me, if this thing were no longer here one day, I wouldn't be upset. I would be upset. Yes. I said, loud and clear, man. Yeah, I do the same thing for Rachel. <laughs> I'm like, I can't, I can't bring myself to throw this stuff yes. out. But if, yes, if please, it disappears, yeah. If you're listening to us, if if yeah. you have that sort of relationship with anybody in your life, please let us know whether or not you're the Drew or the Brian it's in so that sad. relationship. It's so sad because I'm very aware of it. <laughs> it's not with everything, but just certain things. Yeah, certain things I'm sentimental about. Very but cool. I get that from my mom. All She's right. That way. Anyway, you move on to question four. Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. This is from Elisa. Are there any pens that you have a love hate relationship with? A pen you hate to love? I find. That to be the case, particularly with my Visconti Homo sapiens. It's so beautiful and so frustrating. I'm about to send it off to a Dibmeister again. It has unexpected issues, and yet I'm determined to make it the pen of my dreams. For now, I love looking at it, but hate writing with it. Am I alone in the love-hate for a pen? No, you're definitely not. And you're not alone with the love-hate for the Homo sapiens either. I think a yeah. lot of people have that like they want the homo sapiens to that be perfect in particular is they so, want so yeah. i mean it's popular because people want that thing to be so perfect and, and it can be it can be and it sometimes is and it can to be fair. not be sometimes. um but yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, it also often gets sent to a nib technician so mm. um but no you're not alone on the visconti you're not alone with fountain pens in general uh, the one that came to my mind was Lamy Studio, Brian. Studio. I I love that pen's profile. I yeah. love the matte texture of it. I mm. love the way it snaps to cap and yeah. snaps to post. Yeah, slick. I love the profile, like how seamless it is when it's you really cap slick. it. Like, yeah. I love that pen. I do, but I hate it. I hate the grip. Like writing with it. Actually. I hate the clip. You don't like the propeller? despise it what i think it ruins the i, I get it i get it, it. like it's Stop such a everybody. it's such a streamlined pen yeah. and that darn clip is just bulbous and offensive like, to me oh, right I'm exactly it doesn't match at all it's so no it's like it's it's like it's aerodynamic but then that that clip is just like a paddle like just <laughs> it does look a little bit like a paddle. oh my god and the the grip i'm like 
come on. You've got the rubberized grip that you can put on it if you want to. I know. I but wish But you just want it to grip. look cool. So you add that slick metal grip. Like, granted, I have very dry hands, so I'm not slipping and sliding all over the place. Oh, I am. But I, yeah, exactly. But like in- That pen is, that but, pen is one of the worst for me. Because yeah. my, my oily hands will slip on it. It's tapered. And they don't have to it do just, it. Yeah. Like, even if they wanted to do something like ST DuPont does. Like, they have a slick metal grip, but it's- It's, it's, it's got grooves. Yeah. Like, groove yeah. it. Come on. Do something. Yeah. So like that pin drives me nuts because mm. it's so it's got so many awesome parts about it. Yeah, it's a good price too for what it is. I yeah, think it's really sure. high quality for less than a hundred dollars. Do you have you used the stainless steel one? Yeah, that's got the rubber grip on it. That's awesome. I I like, I like that. that. I like that one, but it doesn't have the weight that. Um, oh yeah, it's a little lighter. It doesn't have okay. that like heft that a lot of them do. I love yeah. the lacquered ones. Yeah, the lacquered ones are my favorite. Those well, there's are, like the Lux Studio. That's got the heavier one yeah. and the rubber grip. That's fantastic. But that's a lot more. Those are yeah, and the all and black does too. Yeah, the all black. Yeah. Yeah. So that's nice. So yeah. the studio kind of drives me nuts. Mm. Um, as far as a pen, I love to hate the Monteverde Tool Pen. Um, you do love to hate that pen. I, but then again, I don't truly hate it because it is doing exactly what it needs to do. It's not promising anything it, no, that it's. it's it delivers. Not. It delivers entirely on what it's trying to deliver. So I can't complain about it. It's not a bad pen. It's not a bad pen at all. Jack of all trades, master it's of none. It's just silly. So it's just like <laughs> I just like giving it a hard time. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And then the regatta. So the regatta is a weird pen where I love to recommend the regatta. Mm. I would never want one. Like I like. Yeah, I like I see to, that. But but I've recommended it to people and they love it and I've like hit home runs as far as like customer recommendations. It's a surprisingly go. popular pen. It is, yeah. and and some people have written me back like, oh my god, the regatta is my favorite pen now. Like and they have like three hundred dollar pilots. So like my regatta is the best. I'm like okay. Wow. And so I, I don't know. So I don't particularly care for that pen, but I will recommend it. And that's so that's a weird thing. So I I can't say I love to hate it or I hate to love it. I think it's more of a I hate to love it. Because I, I personally don't care for it, but I'm I'm fully behind it. Yeah, I love to cap and post it too. It's so much fun. It is very satisfying. But uh, yeah, like so chunk. so I, I am a bit at odds with myself about the Monteverde Regatta. Fair but enough. both that and the tool pen, I will say, it is exactly what it needs to be, and I wouldn't change yeah. a thing about them. And that's yeah. that's weird. Um, and then I've got two pens that drive me a little crazy because of their price points. Um, the Peniter Twin Tank Touchdown Filler, I think it's a great pen. I love the fact that it's a slim vac filler. Mm. I just, I don't know why all vac fillers need mm. to be so darn just bulbous chunky. and tubular and chunky. Yeah. yeah. This has a sleek, slim profile, which is great for my hands. Um, I don't love the grip, but whatever, it's fine. Um, but it's just, it's a steel nib and it's just, it's, it's a little too up there compared to the VAC 700. Mm. Like it's less pen than the VAC 700, mm. you know, just physically. Same technology essentially, but with the locking mechanism rather than the threading mm. in the back. Yeah. So there's more manufacturing there, which I would pay more for, but mm -hmm. it's hundreds of dollars more expensive yeah. than the Twisby. And likewise, the Platinum Curados, I think is a great pen, mm. just needs to be a little bit cheaper. Just mm. and both those pens are great. They are objectively great pens, yeah. and I love writing with them. I love operating them. They function well. I am into those two pens mm. very much. So I just wish they were more accessible, and I kind of hate them for that because I want them to be in the hands of more people at lower price points. I think mm -hmm. they would be so much more universally appreciated, and I would just I want them to be used because I believe in those pens. Yeah, I do. Um, and some people genuinely do love using them. But exactly. Not, not as universally as you would hope. No. Based on the utility and the price and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. I, I just want them to have the opportunity to get out there a little bit more so yeah. that they can be loved, yeah. you know? But yeah. their their price is a bit of a barrier for entry, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, once you get to that, you know, plus 100, you know, range with the Curados, you don't, ha you, you, you don't even have to go another 100 to get a golden advantaging point. You know, and then with the Peniter, you've got the VAC 700 down there at $80 saying like, hey, what about me? And it's just, it's in a zone where it's getting forgotten. And that makes me sad mm -hmm. because I don't think that those pens deserve to get, be forgotten. They're just, uh, they're, they're a little, they're a little frustrating, you know, based on where they are. So yeah. those I don't love, I have a love-hate relationship with those for weird reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So that's sense. where I'm at. Yeah, I got some too. Um, I basically have a love-hate relationship with every flex nib pen I've ever used. Oh. 
Doesn't really matter that. the brand. Doesn't matter if that. it's custom made. It's just part of it's my own skill and patience and all what that. What about the what about the Mag Six Hundred? It's great. I haven't. I, I will say I haven't used that one long enough to make a determination okay. about that status. So far, I'm loving that pen. There's little to hate about it, but that remains to be seen in terms of my actual regular use of it. Mm -hmm. I think I've tried to use so many different flex pens. They're, they're basically a novelty to me. I can't use them because I, I like really smooth writing pens to begin with. Mm -hmm. And you have to slow down when using a flex nib. If you want to flex, even if you're not flexing it, you have to write slower and it's going to feel scratchier just inherently because of the softness of those tines. So it just takes more patience and I just don't have that patience. So I tend to like broader nibs and stubs and stuff like that. Um, so I will use flex nibs intentionally for the purpose of flexing them, but I'm never going to use them as like my daily carry. Yeah. Um, and some people do and they love it and that's totally, I get it and that's totally cool. But I just because of what they are, like in order to flex, you're going to inherently have frustrations that are just a trade-off of having that flexibility. So there's some that I'm way more frustrated than others and you know, so on, but I do have a mixed relationship with every flex. I can nib. see that. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have that. Yeah. A lot of people. Um, a lot of extra fine nibs. I kind of feel the same way too. Yeah. Cause I just, there are definitely some that are better than others. But again, I when I first started out in fountain pens, it was like broads and stubs all the way. And I wanted the smooth, smooth, smooth feeling. That's not always practical, depending on the paper and depending on the ink and stuff like that. So I will find myself using finer nibs kind of out of necessity and practicality, but I do not prefer the way that they feel on the page pretty much ever. And I know that so you've kind of said that you appreciate them because you know I do. that they're difficult to make and of like you respect oh, them. 100%. But and I, I fully understand why people like them more like i don't knock you for liking finer nibs better you know more than broader nibs like me but this is a press it's a preference it's a textile thing it's a whatever um what i genuinely have struggle wrapping my head around is we get like overwhelming feedback that people find that their handwriting looks better with finer nibs than with broader nibs and i still don't understand that exactly unless you're writing small and the broader nibs just like mush all your words together yeah is that maybe it that has to be it because i've i've heard like for me that like, the wider nibs make your handwriting look better because they they mask any sort of yes any um, like shakiness yeah. or weird you know weird uh movements and stuff like that like yeah for me that's definitely the case like when i write with a really thin nib all it does is just exaggerate that much more my imperfections and that when I, when I fail to do a T and it turns into an L and then I cross it and all that kind of stuff, like if I have a finer nib, it just shows that that much more exaggerated. Whereas if I have a really broad nib, it'll just kind of blur it all together yeah. and it kind of works out, you know? So yeah, but, but th those, like yeah, those, those can have the same problem though. Like when you accidentally close an E or something like that. That's true. That's true. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just, just, I don't know, different people look at it. So, um, I have kind of mixed mixed relationship with most extra fine nibs. Fines, I'm usually pretty good. That's a really good compromise for me. So I gravitate towards fines. Extra fines, I know I'm walking into territory where I'm like, I'm not gonna love it all the time. Um, uh, I have a mixed relationship with my Pelican M800 with a one and a half millimeter stub. Oh, you my mentioned first, that one. It was my first yeah. Grail pen. I've had it fixed multiple times. <clears throat> for whatever reason, I still, maybe it's an emotional thing. Like it's just, it can never live up to what I hoped it would be at the onset. Mm. So there's nothing I can do at this point to make it repair that. Maybe I'll bring that up in therapy. Maybe it's, a, <laughs> maybe it's something I just need to work through. It's, a, it's really me that's the problem, not the pen at this point. Um, but I've, I've had it like repaired a couple different times. Have you had it I still? Have you, had, have you actually sat down with a nib technician and had it repaired or have you sent it off? I've sent it off. I have not sat down with That's what you need to do. That's probably what I you need. You need to go to, to a pen show and they will give it back and forth and they won't yeah. stop until you say it's good. Yeah. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah. Maybe I'll do that. 100%. Okay. But that one. Again, it's just, it had a lot of baby's bottom and had some skipping stuff. And then I had it ground a little, you know, crisper, but then it was a little too scratchy. And it's just like, I haven't found that. I don't even know what I was looking for, but anyway, there's that. This was like 
12 years ago or something too. So this is going on for a while. Um, uh, the Twisby 580 ALR specifically, the grip on that. Really? Super I didn't think the, fine. I didn't think the grip bugged you. It doesn't bug me, but I don't, I, I love the pen despite that, not because of it. I see. If it had everything else about that pen, but it had the smooth grip like you have on the regular AL, that would be better for me personally. Rachel will not even touch an ALR because she hates the texture. I don't let it stop me from using it. Like that Prussian blue 580 ALR, I keep on going back to that it's pen. The best. I love it. But you if it what? had a smooth grip instead of that texture grip, I would love it just a little bit more. You know what I think could make everybody happy is do fewer rings engraved space them out a little bit more so that rather than being like a texture mm -hmm. it's like you know separated by you know a centimeter or half a centimeter yeah so um, just have like five or six rings yeah yeah so like you so you get that 40 you get that texture hmm. where you get that definition but not a little bit of grip a but texture not, like that yeah. that would like the texture people like rachel like she yeah. wouldn't be freaked out by that there would just be a couple bumps interesting rather than a you know yeah yeah, like a washboard. Because I like that. I like that mm. the 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 you know kind of definition texture yeah. that it gets because yeah. it does look. And it different. looks slick. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't look like slick mm. like the regular ALs do. So I like the yeah. look, but yeah, I get the the yeah. texture can freak people yeah. out. And, but I don't hate it. Right. So maybe that's not like the best example. Um, I had a, a hate to love one. I had the Noodler's Ahab. Mm. I don't like the way it looks. Oh no. I think it's so ugly. That clip is the, one of the ugliest the clips. The clip is really an eyesore. <laughs> the pen, the grip on it is so weird. It has that weird like oh, yeah. step down in the middle of it. It's not comfortable. No, it's just asking for you to slip off. I do like the size of it, but the way that it writes, to me it's like, for me, I have a heavy hand. Yeah. A lot of people complain that the steel flex nibs like with Noodlers and, and you know Conklin and other things like, they're too hard to flex. Mm -hmm. I don't have that case because I have big hands, I have a heavy hand. So for me, it, it feels a little easier, mm -hmm. but the, the Caveman way, flex. yeah, the way that that nib writes, I think is incredible, especially for the price. But I hate basically everything else about the pen. Yeah. <laughs> so when I am gonna flex, when it writes. it's not gonna be an enjoyable experience for me anyway. So that often is a pen that I'll kind of go to just to get the final output of a flexible looking writing but it's not for the enjoyment of actually doing it. Now, I will say I do like writing with an Ahab because my handwriting looks different. Hmm. It looks more different than any other pen I write with when really? I write with an Ahab or a, you know any of the Noodler's Flex nibs. Yeah, because it is so rigid yeah. but flexy. Yeah, it looks like a very harsh, scratchy kind of Tim Burton esque okay. font. Lots of those like straight up and downs, like yeah. line, 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 line. Yeah. Um, but it's fun and in gnarly, hmm. and hmm. Uh, I don't write like that with anything else because I kind of abuse it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we can. I mean, it's yeah. kind of part of the beauty of it. Um, I thought of another one that I'll end on, just as you were talking. Um, the Pilot Parallel. I love the front grip section of that pen. Mm -hmm. The weird wavy, not a clip, but whatever roll Terrible. stop thing. It looks really weird. The long, useless end that just makes it sort of look like a quill calligraphy type well. of thing. <laughs> it doesn't post. No. It's really light, which is fine, but I would like it if it weighed more. So that that's one that I really don't like anything about the pen body itself. Yeah. But the way that it writes is amazing and um, I love it. I wish I could like take that and put it on like a Metropolitan, make like a Franken thing. Aziza over at Gourmet Pens puts them in her Opus 88 demonstrator. Oh, there you go. Okay. You can, apparently you can just pop the front really? grip section right into an Opus 88 demonstrator. Okay. I don't know if any modifications are needed, but from what I understand, it's very it's little a, or none. A big old cap. Like yeah. A cap that can accommodate not only the whole grip section, but then that big flat plated nib mm -hmm. that is not going to work on every pen. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. There you go. So lots of love hates. Let us know what y'all have as yours in the comments. All right. We're finishing things up with question number five today from mm. Robert. Okay. Robert says, I was lucky enough to snag a Sailor 1911L Trinity with a zoom nib hey in this month's sale. Nice. Great pen. Uh, this is probably like the don't miss the boat sale. 
Oh, yeah. uh, from was it September we did that? Yeah. yeah. Um, not only a smooth writer, but a sharp looker. <clears throat> um, overall, they were mentioning that it came with that warning tucked under the clip because it's got the black ion plating on yeah, the nib. Yeah. And there's a little piece of, you know, kind of brown sepia parchment under the nib a uh, clip that says don't use anything except for sailor ink with this pen because of the mm -hmm. nib. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert says, what's so special about sailor inks? Or turning the question around, what properties do some other inks have that might harm the anodized nib? Are there other nibs that might be at risk for the same reason? So essentially, mm. I think Robert's just concerned with that warning and uh, wants to know how legit it is and what he can do to uh, understand the why behind that warning. This is a great question, um, and it's one that can actually be broadened a little bit beyond just Sailor. We'll answer the context of Sailor specifically, um, but this is something that's not uncommon to see with other brands too. Um, you know, I've seen it with Pelican products. Uh, I know Mont Blanc does this too. I think it's less. I believe Fair Faber Castell does. Faber Castell it. does too. I think it's less of an issue of something is so different with that brand's pen or ink that you'd have some wildly different experience than you would with some other brands, pen or ink. And it's more about for their warranty purposes and the, what they're testing their pens for, they know their plating, they know their ink and ink components. They've tested for them to make sure they work and they can guarantee that they're going to work. So they'll stand behind it and warranty it. <coughs> it's less predictable what else you could be putting into the pen. Not even necessarily that another brand's properties of ink are gonna be so different than Sailor in this example, that it would actually affect things in a negative way. But I think it's more of Sailor can't guarantee. Who knows whatever else you could potentially put into your pen, they can't guarantee that it's going to hold up based on whatever possibility that could be. Now that said, you know, all the proper disclaimers and stuff here, we're an authorized sailor retailer. We would say you should always honor whatever the manufacturer says to maintain your warranty and stuff like that. That said, if that doesn't matter to you so much particularly, put whatever the heck you want in your pen, it's your pen, you do whatever you will. Um, and plenty of people do that. And to my knowledge, we've not seen any issues with the plating. I've never seen the um, black ion plating wear off in any way. I've seen no, neither black I. plating wear off on other brands, yeah, but, but never on Sailor. Well, so there's different, if you're talking specifically black plating. Not, not black ion, I mean yeah, like, there's, you there's, know. There's, there's different types of yeah. plating that can have, you know, you have PVD, you have anodization, you have black ion, you have uh, probably a couple other things that I'm even failing to remember. I think there's, the ones that different I've seen pro properties these off have. are like the cheapo, poorly yeah. done ones. You can have like sprayed lacquer. No brand you know, that we like that. currently carry. Yeah, exactly. You can have stuff that can chip off. Um, I mean, even heck, uh, going with Pilot with their black matte vanishing point, when they first came out with it, um, they had you know some warranty issues where like the, the black was kind of rubbing off and you could see the brass underneath. Um, they've since changed. This was like, a decade ago, they changed the how they're doing the the um, the black material on there. I don't even know exactly what they use, but um, it's really not an issue anymore. Mine, so, mine has the brass coming through. Mine, my OG one. Yeah, yeah it's got a little bit of brass wearing well, through the, too. But mine, mine's on the uh, on the plunger. Oh yeah, yeah, all over. It just wears over time. I think some like no, I think once upon a time it got something caught in there so every time i was clicking it it was like scratching it so oh, okay yeah it just wears over time i think i got I, a little piece of crap in there that i i let a team member borrow mine and it came back to me with a scratch on it and that has i think i remember ever since. i think i remember that and it was like oh cool i didn't even like cause that but you know it's okay i don't remember who it was specifically but you know that was one of those things that's sort of like when you like let your kids like play with something and even they might even try to be careful, but they don't even realize what that happened. So you're like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. It's fine. That's fine. It's okay. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, but no, it's like <laughs> important. I think. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a, you know, sailor's pretty strongly worded, you know, with that, with that stuff on it that is. one. Whether or not that's truly warranted, I, I don't think it's a response to they were shipping these pens out and they were having a lot of problems with it and they put that on there. I think it's more of a, they're hedging their 
hedging their bets. They're covering themselves for who knows whatever potential thing. If you put, you know, antifreeze or glow stick fluid inside your pen and then have an issue with the plating, they don't want to be responsible for that. So the plating is probably more sensitive than the standard plating that they use for whatever reason. I don't even know. But I don't know if it is. I don't. I, to my knowledge, it's not. I haven't seen any issues with it. So yeah, that's I, fair. I'm just I generally. I'm imagine. imagining that you know they're putting it on the black one only because of a perceived possibility of sensitivity because they don't put it on any of the other ones. So true. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But you know, I would take it for what it's worth and just you know be more intentional about that. And I would say generally speaking, you know, you obviously do it your own risk, but, um, and not to say that nothing could happen, but I would say if you're concerned about using any ink in your pens, if you're sticking with conventional, non-waterproof, non-crazy property ink, and just using normal fountain pen ink, then you're probably going to be okay with most any pen, most yeah. any plating, most nibs, most any of that kind of stuff. So, And if you do um, want to yeah. be careful, Sailor has hundreds You've of different a, types of inks. So a fart jillion you inks are that you can choose from. You're going to be fine with variety, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. That's what we know about that. All right. Uh, cool. Well, that yeah. is it for Q&A. Okay. We can move on to, uh, we're going to return to Pen Spotlight this week, Brian. Hey, we are. It's we been will a while. have We will have more team, team like meet the team segment. So don't worry about that. There will yeah. be more. There's but, more of the team uh, to meet. Yeah. There plenty is. Yeah. yeah. But we thought uh, we found a good pen to spotlight. We do. We're going to need a large spotlight today, though. Oh, we've got a large spotlight right there. there. It's very big. It's about three feet, this light that we have above us yeah. here. So I think it'll do it. Uh, anyway, let's check out the Magna Carta Mag 1000. Okay, folks, this is the Magna Carta Mag 1000. And the thing is, I have really big hands, so it might be deceiving just how large this pen actually is. Here, let me get it. Put it in a normal You got slight, no, slightly smaller hand. hands. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just look at my hand next to you. Like, yeah. you're, you're not a small guy. No. But, like, my hands are a little chunkier. Yeah. Right? And less pink. It really is amazing how <laughs> pink a, you are. I'm a pink. I'm you're a pink a very, man. Very just different. I'm a very pink man. You're very yeah. But yeah, this thing, crustacean kind of skin. Going look at on. that. It's yeah, a I'm big like pen. A, I'm a cooked lobster. But you know that. what? Our hands won't really show its justice so much. We got to show it next yes, to some other pens. Absolutely. Um. So I grabbed a Pilot Metropolitan because that's a pretty well known. Oh my pen gosh! Look at people that. People have. Just look how much bigger it is. It's kind of crazy. Um. And then I'll show you the nib in just a second because that's really most of the reason why this pen is so crazy. Uh, Pilot Vanishing Point. This is the new 60th anniversary Ken Recce. Using this as a nice little opportunity. It's like twice the size. Show that off. Yep. Um, got a arguably very large pen, the Jinhao X159, which also has a number eight size nib on it. We're going to compare that in a second. I uh, got the beloved Lamy 2000, which uh, many of you are familiar with that size. I don't know. You probably fit an entire Lamy 2000 inside this pen. I think so. And arguably a very large pen as a standard, the Edison Collier, which, you know, approaches its length, but still looks a little shrimpy next to it. Yep. It's kind of crazy. Um, and then Drew, you grabbed another pen over there, yes, which we I can did. show. And then I'll, I'll show all the pens and then I'll show all the nibs. Drew's got the Namiki Emperor Rabbit. This is a very large pen. White Rabbit. This is a arguably huge pen this is probably the largest factory pen so being made this does make the mag 1000 look a little more reasonable yeah. in size um it's the cap is a little bit bigger on the emperor but the body is about the same girth mm -hmm. um overall length is longer on the emperor but the emperor it's really a canvas so you kind of want it to be as big as possible um anyway so we'll show that and Anyway, big pen. It's not super heavy though. I will say, like, and actually writing with it, it's it's a very large pen. It's not going to be for everybody. Um, but there you go. Look at what, that. What really makes this thing so <laughs> stand out so much is the massive nib. It's not. It doesn't even have like a specific size designation to it. It's just the Mag One Thousand nib. I think he calls it a number ten. Does he call it number ten? I believe so. Okay. Which is, I think he said it's technically larger than a like a Yovo number ten would be. I think it's slightly larger, but does I don't Yovo know. make a number ten? I I thought eight was as so high as they is go. Is it the biggest they go? I yeah. don't know. Or then a number ten would be or something. I don't yeah. know. Whatever. Wait, I don't even know if Yovo Do makes a number, number eight. 10? Yovo. 
I they make a number eight. They do because Monograppa's had a number eight before. Oh. Like when we did the. Um, That's a Yovo nib. Yeah, yeah. When we did the uh, 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 what was it? The Dove thing. The Dove one. Yeah. That wasn't Yovo. They found that. That was like an old like. That wasn't Yovo. That was like one Maybe of their that cave. That was one of their cave nibs. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, we digress. Uh, anyway, uh, whoops. There we go. Big nib, big pen, uh, but it's ebonite, so it's actually not that heavy. Right. So it's actually quite comfortable to write with. Um, I'll show you how it writes in just a second. Look at that. Yeah, there's Drew's thumb next to it. It's uh, We jokingly call it like a, a boat paddle or the oar because it's so big. And then it's got an ebonite feed as well, which is equally ginormous. Um, so mine's a fine nib. Normally it has the um, nib size kind of etched into the back of the feed there. Mine doesn't though. I bought it as like a pre-production sample kind of a thing. Um, but everything else is the same as the, the pens you would see. Standard international converter, but you can fill the whole body with ink if you really want to house an entire bottle of ink with you while you travel, I guess. Um, all right, now for the fun part. Let's, let's compare some nib sizes. Shall we start with the arguably more laughable ones? Yeah, let's bring up that um, vanishing point. Vanishing point. So we'll show the vanishing point um, oh you know, my God! There you go. Um, slight, slight difference in size between the two. <laughs> it's just crazy. I mean, the vanishing point nib is technically longer because it's like embedded in there, but still, um, it's going to be a little different. Oh my God, you could fit like twenty of those on the Magna it's Carta. Kind of amazing. Um, let's do a Lamy two thousand, shall we? Because that one also has a, a, a hooded nib that's kind of small. Um, there you go. Jeez, we little Lamy two thousand nib. It's ridiculous. It's so tiny. So there's that. Okay. Got it? Yeah, cool. All right. Next up, let's do the Metropolitan. This is a pretty, pretty decent all-around normal size nib, but it does not look like it in comparison. It looks, it looks tiny. It looks miniature. It looks like it was shrunk. Mm -hmm. But that's a standard pilot steel nib. Um, next up, let's see here. Let's go to a number six nib, kind of a standard size that most people are familiar with. Yep. This is on the Collier. This is a Yovo number six. And not a small nib. Not a small nib. This is a it makes pretty it, good size, it makes full it look size like, nib. It makes it look like a number five. Saying, it does. It makes it look so small. Length and width. Like it's just crazy. So there you go. Um, next up, we'll go to the number eight size because we got the Jinhao X159. So this is one of the bigger nibs that we sell. This is about the biggest nib that we've seen previously. There you go. It's big, it's wide. See, this this looks like a number still, six to me now. The the tip of the number eight size nib just makes it to the shoulder of this number 10. Golly. So big and just like, it's so massive. Just look at the feed. The feed the whole, on this monster. The whole thing could fit inside the feed. It really could. It's crazy. All right, now the real tests. The biggest nib previously that we've had has been for the Emperor. Now I'm going to lovingly remove this and set the cap aside. Oh, such a gorgeous pen. Will it be bigger than the Emperor? This is the big test, right? So, Emperor next to... <laughs> oh yeah, Mag One Thousand. Uh, the Mag One Thousand is bigger than the Emperor. It absolutely nib. is. Now it's a steel nib. It's not gold. The Emperor is definitely the biggest gold nib. Um, width is a little bit wider, and length is a little bit longer. Kind of all around is bigger. Um, feed wise, much bigger. Feed. I mean, I thought the feed was big on the Emperor, and it is arguably. Um, yeah, but still, kind of. If you're going just purely for size. Uh, Mag 1000 is going to be the biggest. You can't really top it. There you go. And the uh, Pelican M1000 would be a good comparison too, but it's going to well, be that's smaller, smaller than, than the, the Emperor. Emperor. Yeah. The, the feed might be a little bit bulkier than the Emperor. Same with the Sailor King of Pens. Yeah. You know, all of these are going to be smaller than the Emperor. Um, so real quick, you know, since you're like, oh, it's such a big nib, like, does it make a difference in terms of how it writes? I mean, not really. It writes well. Like this is uh, this is the fine nib version. I got Pilot uh, Iroshizuku Kanpeki. It's uh, smooth. Is you it bouncy at all? Um, it's got a little bounce to it. I mean, it's a steel nib. You can probably see me like flexing it a little bit. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm putting some pressure on there, not crazy. It's not gonna be like no. flexy long but is, variation. But it is a long piece of metal. Yeah, it? it feels 
you know, it feels closer to a stiffer gold nib, you know, uh, than it does like a stiff steel nib. Um, overall, pretty smooth. The flow is good. The flow is going to be good, you know, honestly, a lot because you got that ebonite feed in there. And so it's just going to, um, I really can't write and talk at the same time. So I'm just going to make some scribbles, swirls, stuff like that, you know, little dots. That's a good sign of good flow when you can do these little dots, little ticks. Things like that. But everything is made in-house in India by Magna Carta, the yeah. nib, the feed, everything. Yeah. All in all, pretty good writing experience. Now, I mean, I know if you're looking Magna Carta, you're going to be comparing this to the Mag 600, which has the Flex, which is a gold nib. That's actually less than this pen. Yes. But this pen, you're getting, you're getting a whole lot of pen. You're getting a whole lot um, of pen, a whole lot of nib. So I don't know. It's a bit of a novelty. You're getting this massive nib. Does it write that much better? No. Um, than like any other potentially nib could. You know, it's, this is in the $400 range. So you can get custom 823. You can get some great writing gold nibs for this price, but it's an ebonite pen, ebonite feed. Oh, it just said maximum recording time reached. Oh, well, so, anyway, we're switched back um, to here. Yeah. Um, um, so what do you think is a practical reason for owning this pen, Brian? I would say there's no practical reason for owning this pen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, no, if you if you really like large, relatively light pens. Mm -hmm. um, this one, you know, would definitely be a contender. You know, something like the color. Yeah, so a, a larger you know, pen that may be good for if you've got cramping or arthritis. Yeah, definitely. Like that's the thing we hear with most pens, not like the Emperor, because that's that's in a whole other league, but things like the Collier and the Opus 88, you know, other really big, relatively light pens for their weight. Um, we hear it's really good for people that have you know, whether wrist or hand or finger issues, it's more comfortable as a daily writer. But they don't, because they don't want something, you know, huge and heavy. Correct. Because too much weight weighs on your hand and gets your hand tired. Too thin and you have to like grip harder and control it more. This this really strikes a good balance yeah. there. So it could okay. be really good well, for Well, there that. you go. Practical reason number one. Sure. I'd say practical reason number two is if you are like me and you have you know, you choke up on your grip a lot. You like to have your fingers far away from the page. Mm. Uh, it's not bad for that because the True. nib is so huge. It forces you because to do I that. very rarely hold my pens at the grip section. I usually hold them farther back. back yeah. yeah, I just don't like being that close to the page. I mean, this one you 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 really can't hold it off the grip section because then you're like you're in the middle of the pen at that point. Yeah, like it just it's it's gonna be back there. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't mind being in the middle of the pen. Like I'll, I'll hold my two thousand. You can also. I'll hold want. my 2000 up here by by the window. Look at when you post it. Good lord. And I have, a, I have big hands too. That's a obnoxious. normal hand would be like this. That it, is it, a. It looks like a therapy pen. That's an absolute unit. It's kind of what it looks like. Now, we don't. I don't even think we show it posted in Someone, Someone in the uh, comments of my What's New video last week said that it looked like a, um, a theater prop, like a stage prop. Like if you needed to write with a fountain pen on stage so that the audience far away could see that it's a fountain pen, this would be the thing to do. Yeah, you'd be like, wow, look at that nib. Mm. Yeah, I think it uh, it matches that. Cool. So anyway, that's the Mag 1000. We have them. Um, yeah, new brand. Um, and we're, you know, getting it out there and seeing how you all think. So we like them, but we want to see what you think too. So if you happen to use one, please let us know what you think of it. All right. Um, I think we're good for the pen spotlight. Now we're on to the nonsensical portion. Now we're moving to the nonsensical portion of this yes, program. Yes, up, up until now it's been <laughs> deadly serious. Let's talk about what's happening. All right, well, Record, first of all, quick. oh. Put this away okay. before we, <laughs> I don't wanna like accidentally knock something off and do something crazy. Everything else I can deal with getting disrupted. I'm just gonna put it here for now and I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Wipe I just, it off I just wanted it to, I just wanted it not to be in a knockoffable state. Yes. All right. All right. Um, well, first things first. Like you, I went treat or tricking. Did you now? Uh huh. Did you do more tricking or more treating? Uh, well, here's the thing. We didn't do a lot of either because I don't know if it's with every kid, but we mm -hmm. went with Archer and his friend Sal, and every house we visited, I had to tell him. Say trick or treat. Say thank you. They don't. Yeah. They don't say really trick do or treat. That. Say thank you. Yeah. Say trick or treat. It's like you're not saying trick or treat. You're not saying thank you the whole time. And then when he would finally say like, oh thank you, I'm like, girl, dude, just I don't feel like my mom had to remind me that much. 
to say thank you and to say trick or treat. When I was a kid, you'd go to a door, the whole like group you were with, trick or treat, all nice loud one. Yeah. Archer's just like. Did you actually go up to doors and like ring doorbells? Oh yeah, dozens. So the neighborhood that we went to, we went with uh, one of uh, Ellie's friends mm -hmm. and they live in like a proper, you know me, I'm in, I live in the middle of nowhere. No one trick or treats in our neighborhood. Um, so we went to like a friend's neighborhood that is like a proper subdivision. Mm -hmm. They all, I don't know if it's just a COVID thing, but I think I was talking to some of their neighbors and stuff and it was even before COVID. They all like sit outside in their driveways and like hand out candy outside. So like- Well, there was a couple of those. Basically, but this whole neighborhood, like basically none of the houses, you had to like go up and ring the oh, doorbell. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so, no, most of them were knocks or rings for us. Okay. Yeah. So maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a by the neighborhood kind of a deal. Probably. I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, we definitely had some people, people that just left out a bucket. Some okay. people that, you know, were yeah, sitting yeah. outside. If they had costumes, they usually sat outside. Yeah. Um, so no, it was fun. It was nice and cool. I appreciated that. I like yeah. the cold Halloween. There were lots of people like doing like their little camping stoves and stuff like that. Oh, nice. You know, like in their driveway. Oh, so I think that's it's like cool. a community thing. Yeah, so that would... might be unique to this neighborhood. Yeah, our, our, we have a pretty good community in our neighborhood as well. Um, yeah. It wasn't as popular as last year though. I don't know if yeah. maybe we just got there late because we started after dark. Okay. Um, and I think either most kids had already done it or maybe mm. there were, just weren't a lot of kids out. But Interesting. it was definitely, it seemed like there were less kids running around hmm. this year. So I don't know, maybe kid, parents are just getting started earlier than, maybe but like, maybe I was like. Maybe neighborhood's just getting older and then we the wanted, kids are, We uh, wanted to yeah. wait until dark. Like that's, that makes sense. Like that's when you see all the decorations and stuff. I mean stuff. like before dark, that's when like the little kids go out, right? Yeah, like the I young, guess. Like I the really know. young, like the toddlers and stuff, you know. Probably, but I, I didn't come think. across any of those Halloween buckets that someone had stolen all the candy out of. Oh, there was candy in all the buckets. So I was, I'm happy to say that there were no, you know, crazy selfish kids or parents in my neighborhood. So that was nice to see. So that was fun. Um, Archer wore the costume that I've been working on since June. Yeah. So Did you get a that, good response. It was, uh, no, not really. <laughs> People were like, fun. wow, that's a, that's, that's a really complicated costume, <laughs> you know? That was like so rewarding for you after months of work. Yeah, right? I didn't. You know, it's fine. I didn't yeah. really expect anybody to know who he was, but that's what he wanted, so that's what he got. Okay, so that's what go. that's what matters. Is you know that you made an. Awesome he's going to remember that his dad right. worked worked a lot and that's right. And tried to make you'll it remind him of special. that too if he doesn't remember. Absolutely, because it was a lot of work. <laughs> Absolutely, I will. <laughs> that's what good parents um, do, right? But there was a you know, post Halloween sale at Spirit Halloween okay. that I went into to try to find some, I was thinking about, cause we're doing a scavenger hunt thing here at work that I host and yep. I have a theme. It's gonna be like Academy Awards slash Hollywood theme. And I was oh, yeah. gonna, I was thinking about, should I tell people to dress as their favorite movie character or dress like mm. they're going to an awards ceremony? Okay. So I went to Hall Spirit Halloween to see if maybe I could find like a, a pirate outfit or something from like, you know, look kind of cinematic. But all the pirate stuff looked stupid, and you yeah. know, I was like, "No, it's dumb." So I just I came back. I'm like, "We're gonna do award ceremony attire, not movie character Everybody attire." Has some dress up clothes. To wear. Yeah. So, yeah. but while I was there, I saw that everything was fifty percent off. Uh -huh. I wanted to buy everything, <laughs> and I was texting Shane. I'm like, "You want this? You want this? You want this? You want this?" She's like, "No, no, no. We don't mm. need that." I was like, mm. "But, but, but." Oh man, they have like when when we were kids, Brian. They had a big clunky plastic machete a big wobbly ax right. and a big wobbly scythe. Right. That was it. Like, yeah, or, or more or less. like you, as far as like weapons went, like you might have a caveman club, hmm. but that was it. You went to the Halloween store, you had those few things. Now they've got just the the swords and the weapons. Like, man, they look so real. And oh, I wish I could just like send some of these back in time to myself. Hmm. But I did buy Archer a top hat because he, it wears like a foam top hat that I made him to like dress up days and stuff like that. So I'm like, here's a, it was $10 and half off. So I'm like, whatever, I have a five, five, $5 tap, nice. top hat. All right. And he, he wanted, when we were there looking for his something, I don't know, he saw that they had link ears and they were seven ninety nine half off. I'm like, sure, have some elf ears. There you go, buddy. But then I saw an inflatable Baymax costume from Big Hero 6. <laughs> Not the big white one, but the armored one, the red one oh. that he wears later in the movie. And it was normally sixty dollars, half off. Yeah, but that was still still thirty bucks. He doesn't need still, it. Right. But I'm like, this looks awesome. I was like, Shannon. Oh my gosh, I can I, see why Shannon was I like, really no, wanna, Drew. I really want to get this for Archer. She's like, ah, 
fine. Oh, so, did you get it? Yes, I did. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I was like, hey, God, hey, Archer, wow. guess what I got? And he loved it. He kept on, yeah. he, he was putting it on. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, he, he loved it. He was running around all weekend in that thing. Oh, that's so fun. And of course, doing exaggerated movements in that thing just looked hilarious. hilarious. Absolutely. He broke the fan like within 30 minutes. He was like shaking around and you're just like, I was like, oh boy. He was like on the verge of tears. I'm like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Took it apart, you know. You've done some electrical things. Yeah, I, I was I was like, okay, it's got two wires. I might need to solder something, but it wasn't right. electrical electrical issue. The fan was actually wobbling. Oh. So it wasn't glued or affixed to the post of the mm. motor. So okay. I'm like, all right, well, let me just glue this in, retighten all the screws, mm -hmm. and you know, we're fine. And it was, it was fine. So I nice. fixed that up. Look at but, you. I mean, I'm sure you can replace that thing from, you know, oh yeah, you know, two bucks. Yeah. So anyway, we did that. That was stupid and silly. Um, we got our, uh, Archer already got his COVID and flu shots. He was fine. No effect. This was weeks ago. Mm. Shannon and I got ours on Saturday morning. Oh, fun. COVID, flu. Yep. Um, my right arm hurts. I forgot what shot that was in that mm. arm. Drove me nuts. Couldn't sleep on it or anything. But mm. Shannon got the fever, Ugh. got the aches, got the arm pain, the whole nine yards. She Jeez. was like useless for the whole day. She felt terrible. Gosh. So, which is weird because she didn't have, she had that reaction during the initial mm. COVID vaccine, but none mm. of the follow-up boosters. So this is like booster weird. number three, I think. And yeah. then all of a sudden she gets the gnarly side effect. So she had like a temperature over a hundred, like. Gosh. Yeah. It was Rachel bad. had a lot of soreness, but not the temperature thing. Who knows? So yeah. that was a bummer, but we were ready for it. We did it on a Saturday just in case. So yep. it's all good. Yep. Um, we were going to, uh, this coming weekend, go on a non-official work uh, camping trip, mm. um, but it's looking like it's going to rain, Ooh. and it's looking like the host team member that is hosting it is having some personal issues with his family, mm. and he might not be able to come. So I think now they're going to move it to the spring. Okay. So uh, that's a little bit, a bit of a bummer, but I did get out the tent over the weekend, okay. set it up in the front yard oh, for all the neighbors fun. to see. You know, so okay. I was just like making sure because my brothers and I, I have two brothers, and they, um, well, I have half brothers and step brothers and i have more than two brothers but <laughs> uh, my brothers these two brothers and i went you know three-way into buying a tent for us to share from we okay. for whatever reason what but size my, tent like how big is this? Uh, it's a six person tent oh wow so it's like a real tent well all three of us have stayed in there together comfortably i wouldn't want to put a fourth person person in there oh, okay so it's like so six person you could tent. physically fit like six, six human bodies in there probably. like yeah. six human bodies could fit in there but your stuff only as your, an alternate to sleeping outside yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but um i went ahead and set that up and mm -hmm. uh archer helped me it was fun all the parts were there yeah i will say that my brother zach packed it up perfectly everything was folded nicely nice. i was like all right zach all he right. brought it to the beach though so i did notice some of those little like stickers you know that can stick in your feet the little oh. thorn balls you've oh. seen those yeah yeah those some of those were stuck into the mesh parts of it so i'm like oh Wow. I remember that those parts of the beach. Yeah. You no, know, thank you. So I had to mm. pull those out. But other than that, that was that was fun. Cool. Um, but yeah, other than that, we took a pretty we we intentionally didn't do a lot this weekend because we knew that we were gonna get our shots and yeah. just in case we didn't feel good, we didn't schedule a whole lot. That was smart. Um so yeah, we just kind of chilled and you know, nice. ran some ran, ran some errands, nothing too crazy. Yeah. Um and then uh I will say yesterday I bought a happy meal for my lunch. It's mm -hmm. not not a big moment, but I did it on purpose because I wanted the toy. Is it Happy Meal for yourself? Happy Meal for myself, yes. Did it make you happy? It did because they're doing a thing, Brian, where they're doing a Disney 100th anniversary event. Oh. Normally, McDonald's toys suck. Like when we were kids, McDonald's toys were cool. Yeah. Now, they suck. They're right. terrible. Yeah. They're jankety they're and cheap. dumb. Yeah. But these little Disney things, they come in a cute little box mm -hmm. with all the little characters you can get around the side. You open up the box. There's a little paper that they're wrapped in and you get two little figurines mm -hmm. on little platforms that say Disney 100, two in the little box. Yeah. I got Ariel the Little Mermaid and I got Chewbacca. Oh, nice. And it just made me so happy. So I gave the Little Mermaid to Shannon and- Of course, because she loves Little Mermaid. She and wants absolutely does. all Little Mermaid gifts from here on she out. She definitely does not, but <laughs> she would not say no to, 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 to one. An authorized hobby. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I think I'm gonna go back tonight because I told Archer he's now he wants one, so. Tonight, she's got rehearsal for something. So if you both go get Happy Meals, that's four toys. Yeah. Right? I get super How much is a Happy Meal right now? I don't even know. It's only five bucks. Five bucks? Okay. Which is not bad. Like, fast food prices are insane right now. I know. But if you get a Happy Meal, 
you can get a, so what I got, I got a six piece McNugget Happy Meal okay. with a drink and double fries or extra fries for five bucks. It was four ninety nine. Like that's not a bad meal. Like that that filled me up just fine. Yeah. I got another. I got a small coffee in addition to that, so it was like six bucks. But whatever, I'll take it. Okay. So it's hard to eat cheap at fast food restaurants these days. Yeah. So yeah, did that. I don't think my kids have ever had a happy meal. Okay. All right. Feed my kids healthy brangoule. No, it's definitely not that. <laughs> like Ellie <laughs> will only eat like processed meats and stuff. Okay. Like that. Um, They've never had a happy meal. I'm trying to think. They've definitely had McDonald's. We don't eat a lot of McDonald's, but um, I eat way too much McDonald's. It's no judgment. Yeah. Um, I do plenty of things that aren't healthy too. Um, no, I'm just trying to think if they've ever had. Maybe they did like early on, and they just maybe the toys were so forgettable. I just don't even remember them. Yeah. Yeah, they might have had a Happy Meal a couple of times. They kind of are forgettable. But it definitely wasn't like it's not like something they're going to remember in their childhood and be like, oh my gosh, Happy Meals. They'll be like, oh, that's whatever. Yeah. And now they're like getting full proper adult meals because they both weigh more than Rachel. So it's not cheap in our household anymore yeah, food wise, but fair enough. Go figure. Yeah. And then the only, only other notable thing was that today is a uh, voting day. We're recording this on November 7th. And it is. um you it voted. Is. I did. I, I see voted. that. You can't really see it on your yeah, shirt because it's, it's there. got a lot of other noise, but yep. it's there. I noticed. Yep. So I got up uh, the school has been closed for the last two days, but our voting center is Archer's elementary school so yeah see we had i we took had, him to his school this morning he's like wait why are we going here what's going on yeah i thought i had a four-day weekend yep yeah you're like no, but uh this yeah this is like what adults do got that done so <laughs> yeah um that's cool yeah and yeah. Uh, our my office is kind enough to pay me to go vote so we i did that. not have to we do that. make any sort of concessions there so that's appreciated it's important yeah do it if you're in this country um cool yep that's it for um me. cool uh we also did trick-or-treating I mentioned last week in my Rick Astley attire that Joseph was also going as Rick Astley as his pivot, his last minute costume right. change. And it was such a hit. Nice. Like at first he like didn't really want to do it. And I was like, just try it. Like, try it. Like some people aren't going to get it, but those that do are going to friggin' love it. And he did it. He like definitely got more into it. So did he have the song playing? Oh yeah. Nice. Like he had his phone. He would... And it was, so did, it was did, did he cue it up when he approached or did he just always have it going? Well, it was like, so him and his sister and his sister's friend. And there were like some other, her, Ellie's friend. What did I say? Yes, yeah, Ellie, his sister, Joseph's sister. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused with my own story. Um, her friend had some other friends from the neighborhood that like joined us for part of it. So there was like a group of them. So whenever there's like a group of kids, it's like everybody's kind of goes up at once and they're like, oh, you're this, you're that. What are you? And they would be like him. They thought he was like a banker or something because he's wearing like a suit jacket and a striped shirt. And then he would cue up the music. And as soon as the music came on, everybody was like, oh my gosh, because nobody expects it. And that's the whole point nice. of the Rick Roll. Oh, so he so, got to just be a serial Rick Roller he was all night long. And which is like everything he could want in life <laughs> as a middle schooler <laughs> to just go around and Rick Roll a bunch of strangers. That's amazing. So he was friggin' loving it. That is so awesome. I wouldn't be surprised if he wants to go again next year. He'll be seven feet tall. You can get you know. him his own suit jacket next year. <laughs> <laughs> he did not fit in my suit jacket no. at all, but it was. He might fun. next year. Who knows? Yeah, right. Um, so that was fun. And Ellie went as uh, Shadow, and Shadow the Hedgehog. Mm -hmm. um, she did a really good job. She made her own costume and everything, and she had like a wig and stuff with the black and red nice. hair. And she did a really, really good job. Um, and not everybody knew who she was, but there were definitely some, you know, some of like the dads that were out there in like their, you know, Obi Wan Kenobi outfits with their lightsabers. You know the ones who maybe lean a little more nerd heavy. They, I don't know what that's like. They yeah, I know right. They they recognize and they're like, oh, what's up, Shadow? And then that was like, you know, really cool for her to like get recognized. You know, that's awesome. So that was pretty fun, and they had good. They weren't like crazy. Yeah, they're just they're such well behaved kids. They weren't like going nuts, and they got a good amount of candy, and they're having like five pieces of candy a day, and that's it, and they're not going nuts. So I'm like, wow, okay. They're, Archer's not a big candy yeah. kid, like. Gosh, our oh, our man. our like bucket of Halloween candy like we had to throw some away the week before Halloween yeah because he needed his bucket oh wow like you know it was mostly just like you know dum dums and a couple other random oh, things yeah. but like he's still like you know not a like not he's so very much a snacky snackins but yeah candy not usually like interesting homie will always eat some fruit like just mm. he is he will eat all of the strawberries and blueberries. 
he can get his hands on. Yeah. And like, I mean, you know, amazing. fruit snacks and, you know, <laughs> crackers and like he loves to shove things in his face. But um, yeah, he just he's a, he's a grazer. He always has been. Mm, he doesn't yeah. want to sit and eat a meal. He wants to have something, go do something, come back, eat something else, come back. You know, fair enough. Can't concentrate on food. Yeah. Now, if you feed him in front of a TV, he'll eat the whole thing. Interesting. But he just can't concentrate on eating. Yeah. Well, I mean, he can't concentrate on anything. But you know. yeah. Gee, I wonder where he gets. I don't from. know what that's like either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So all in all, very successful. Halloween awesome thing. Yeah. Um, and then let's see. I bet here. you wish you had this. You know, this would have come in handy. Yeah. Got to be honest. It was with chilly. You. Actually, I did. I bought this the previous weekend, so I did have this. But I was still dressed in my Rick Astley Oh, you wore, you dressed up too? So, yeah. So cool. I was in a jacket. I was in a, I was warm. I was fine. nice. Um, let's see here. What else? So uh, Joseph had a hangout with his friends. He's getting to the age where that's like a thing, like a teen hangout. Did you drop him off at the mall? No, it was at a friend's house, but it was like a surprise birthday party for one of his friends. Nice. So that was cool. But it was like, yeah, from like six to 10 o'clock at night. And I was like... Okay, we're approaching teenage years here. They're just on a different time scale or mm -hmm. whatever. And so he had a good time there. And Ellie was like, this was on like a Friday or Saturday night. I don't remember which one it was. Saturday night, I think. So it was like us and Ellie. So it was like, all right, she wanted to like do something kind of special. So we went out, got like pizza from their favorite pizza place, got some Cold Stone ice cream, which I did not have any because I'm trying to be better. Did you really? Wise. Yeah, I just, it's, I, I, I'm always very, just got it for her. It's very easy for me to refuse Cold Stone because it's so ridiculously overpriced. It is really expensive. I that refuse. Helps. I refuse. It's like seven bucks. It's you insane. Get a small one. I'm so like, what we do is like, if we want to get some, we'll, I'll like, we'll double up. We'll get like a medium yeah. size and split it or whatever. It's ludicrous. But I'm like, that's that's a lot of money. I mean, it's really good. But um, and then we were originally going to watch Nightmare Before Christmas because Ellie really wants to watch it, but Rachel's really not big on Halloween, so she was like, sort of willing to watch it. Mm -hmm. But then it was just like, I know she's not going to like it. Just tell her you it's know? a Christmas movie. I don't think that matters. She yeah. just doesn't. Yeah. That's a debate in the house. Yeah. Um, it's definitely a Christmas movie. But the Barbie movie is out. We still need to watch that. You haven't seen it at all. No. Because right. we went to see it as a team, but you weren't there. Yeah, I was. You had something. You, you were like off that day or yeah. something. Well, I saw it in the theater. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, Rachel, like Rachel and her sister and her parents, like they have to see it because they reference so many like throwback outfits and you know, stuff like that. So I didn't, I'm like kind of aware of Barbie. I have an older sister and I like played with Barbie and stuff like that, but I didn't, I wasn't like aware, like in the, yeah. in you the, didn't know, yeah, the you didn't know like which the, types of Barbies there yeah, were. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know what was going on. My sister would be like, play with this. And I'm yeah. like, okay. Yeah. You know? um, Shannon. But I, I watched it enough of the movie to know like, oh my gosh, for those that like Barbie, this is going to be like, Amazing. Yeah, I want to see it. What what it's stre really what good. streaming thing it's is really on? good? I we bought a DVD. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, because we were out and we we could stream it or whatever. And there's streaming options, but we went to buy the I guess the Blu-ray or something like that at Target because it was like right near the pizza place we're mm -hmm. going. Um, so we did like the online purchase and pick up in store kind of thing. But it, like somebody bought it before we got there because it was like it was on the shelf and it was like on one of a few uh... left or whatever. But they still had the DVD and the DVD was like nine bucks or something. So I was like, okay, yeah. Fine, I yeah. can't tell the difference, you know, for it's not that, it's, you know. Yeah, it's not Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I mean, it's still a pretty spectacular movie, like visually, but, you know, we're not like super it's a comedy like, video files, yeah. you know, where I can like, ooh, I can really right. tell the difference between like 4K and 1080. Like, right. Oh, no, if it's a comedy. It's, it's Yeah, it's cool. So we watched that on saturday nice and did you like it It was yeah it was great nice they had a blast so i think we're gonna watch it again because rachel's family is gonna come down and visit us for thanksgiving and so we're gonna watch it together with them and that's gonna be a blast nice so, it's a super entertaining movie i had no qualms about watching it again yeah so no, i'd like to see yeah, it's it it's well done and it's very like i don't know it's a very progressive yeah. movie that was kind of feels very positive interesting yeah it was very positive yeah, yeah which is kind of cool and friggin' man, I just all the characters in there, like uh, what's his name, Ryan Gosling, mm -hmm. is just hilarious in that thing. Really well done. Anyway, um, and then um, playing more tenor sax. Nice. Getting all into that. Nice. Having an absolute blast. I'm like picking it back up faster than I would have thought. I'm so glad. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, it's been forever since I played it, and I'm definitely like building up endurance and trying not to sound like a dying goose which definitely still happens but, do you have a duke um, silver trilby hat yet 
I don't, but I should get you one. You should. Oh, that's a great Halloween costume idea. Next year. Duke Silver. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Adam had suggested I go as Bill Clinton, which... Duke Silver is way cooler. Yeah. I was, th- <laughs> I was like, obviously, I need to go as somebody with a tenor sax. Yeah. But yeah, Duke Silver would be great. I have to grow out the mustache, though. Well, uh, when you did Robert <laughs> Goulet, you you shaved everything but the mustache and filled it in, and that worked yeah. just fine. Yeah, but this was, that was an old show choir trick. Yeah, is you just you just grow enough stubble, yeah. and then you use mascara. Yeah, and it really makes it look a lot darker. That works. Or I could just use the paste on whatever. Yeah, that's cool too. Um, but yeah, um, so it's funny because like like I mentioned, I'm in therapy, and I'm not going to get all into it, but music was a more pivotal, more important part of my like adolescent than I even really realized, I think. And, you know, of course, life goes on, you get busy, you get middle age. I don't know, call it a midlife crisis, sure. Um, you just kind of lose touch with some of the things that you, like, you used to really love doing when you were younger. And I'm sort of like trying to rediscover some of that. So it's like, I have no plans to I don't know what that's in like. A, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm sure none of y'all can relate, right? No, no, but I'm saying like, I've literally not stopped doing the things I've been oh. doing since I was a kid. <laughs> well, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I mean, I have definitely had to give up things for like long periods of time just because of practicality. And not that there's any practicality with a tenor saxophone at this age. with a business Other than a kids. very convincing Halloween costume. I mean, it would definitely work, but I don't know. It's just like, literally I was prompted up to like, when's the last time I played music just for the enjoyment mm-hmm. of it. And it's like, boof. Like, Ever? Almost never. Like yeah. I was always practicing for something. Because like you got or, into it for you know, school. Performing or yeah, marching band, like those types of things. I enjoyed doing it, but I never did it purely for the sake you of were enjoying practicing because someone assigned something to you. Yeah, or it was like part of my whatever identity yeah. experience, that kind of thing. So now I'm literally just doing it for the sake of enjoying it. And I'm like, I actually really freaking enjoy this That's amazing so i'm having a blast um i'm very seriously considering actually buying one because like i've rented it i've only had it for a couple of weeks but i'm like i'm enjoying it so much i'm like i know i knew one of two things would happen either i would do it and just be like okay like I, it's really not practical i'm not able to make the time or practice or it's so hard and i'm get discouraged or whatever or i would do it and it would just like reawaken that passion in me even if you do take another break like you've got you know presumably decades of life left so you can take a break and then get back into it i'm taking a two decade break so even if i play it for six months and then take a break and pick it up in a year i'm still better yeah Yeah. exactly yeah so i'm 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 picking it up again pretty quick and having a good time and then so i was talking just take just just take it out of your hammer budget don't buy a couple hammers for you know the next couple weeks and sell a few hammers and you know (laughs) sell a few dozen hammers a few dozen hammers i sure got hammers to spare um but rachel plays piano Mm -hmm. and she played all kinds of she played flute she played bass guitar all kinds of stuff we both played a myriad of instruments but my problem is i've always played instruments that like you can't really play on your own contrabass clarinet sousaphone these types of things but tenor sax is like okay like that's a kind of universal instrument that you can play with a bunch of different things. Um, and Rachel plays piano. So it's like, oh, we can actually like do that together. So she's got um, she's got a Clavinova, a Yamaha Clavinova, which you can like, it's like a digital piano basically, but it was actually her mom's from like 30 years ago. Nice. It has floppy disks that you put in, nice. like the three and a half inch floppies oh, yeah. that you put in I've and have those. like all the stuff. Yeah, so it's like very 90s instrument. Um, but yeah, so she'll put that in. She can like, because... The piano is in the key of C, tenor sax is in B flat. So I can't just like read piano music and play it because it will it'll sound off. But she can transpose the clavinova down to match the saxophone. So she can play the same notes on the piano, but it sounds lower so that it matches the sax. I know you don't have like a lot of musical thing, but nope. basically like if she plays a C on the piano and I play a C on tenor sax, they're not going to sound the same because it's not tuned to the same note. Long story, but... She can transpose it down. We can both read the same piece of music and it sounds appropriate. Nice. So that's really cool because that's way easier than me trying to like transpose any of her music into my key. So we did that uh, just last night, actually. I was like, Rachel, let's like bust out some stuff because she's got all these little jazz piano things or whatever. And I was like, let's just goof off together. But the kids like were immediately drawn to it. Oh, yeah. It's like your parents in the sex concert loud. Yeah. And Ellie really wanted to like try the saxophone. And I was like, it was like 30 seconds into me starting to play. She wanted to try it. And I was like, all right, cool. Like Classic this. kid. Oh, I want to do it. 
but that's like part of like I really like my kids have like kind of a musical knack, but they just haven't like necessarily wanted to to get into it. So I'm like secretly a little part of me is like trying to introduce them to it to see because again it was so impactful for me at that age. And I gotta say, like tenor sax is kind of a big instrument. It takes a bit of air to move through it. And she definitely sounded like a dying goose. But she was like, even after a little bit of practicing, I was like telling her how to hold the keys and she was kind of sticking with it. And she's, she's got some power, man. <laughs> she can put some noise through that horn. That's Rachel not surprising. had a lot of patience there, but I don't know. She like really kind of enjoyed it and was taken to it. And I was like, okay, okay, let's see what we can do here. So I don't know, we'll see where that goes. I'm not gonna put any expectations, but I'm just gonna like play it around them and try and introduce them to some stuff. So we'll see how it goes. That's really so. cool. Cause that, that's, a, that's a very, different set of mental muscle that you're exercising with music oh, yeah, for sure that you have kind of had not atrophy but you know yeah. a musical passion is different than a creative passion like in woodworking yeah. or artistry like yeah it is different that's a different sort of itch you needed to scratch and i bet yeah. that when you're doing it now you didn't realize just how bad you missed it it's true it's true i always I had good memories of it and really enjoyed doing it. But again, most of the instruments I played were so big and expensive, it was never practical or I never even came across one to try it again. You're not alone. There outside are a of lot like a school of, setting. I've spoken to many people over the years who had used to play an instrument and stop for years and years and years. Yeah. And when they pick it back up, it's like a void that they didn't know was empty is now yeah. all of a sudden filled and they're like, oh my God. Yeah. It's like getting used to only breathing out of one nostril mm. and you're just kind of like, you know, like, all right, this is fine. But then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God. Yeah. Ooh, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what I love about it too, like woodwind, so I've got like, I've played, you know, guitar and all these other things, but like woodwinds especially, it's like such an in completely immersive like experience because it involves your breath, your mouth, like muscles in your face your fingers, you know, it's like chest breathing. Like it's it's like a full body experience mm -hmm. doing it that requires just everything you have to do it well. And you're thinking about so many different things and especially the saxophone. Cause again, I only played it for like a year. I played a lot of clarinet, which is like basically one key plays, you know, one note. But saxophone, there's like alternate fingerings you can do to play keys so that when you're doing things, you, if you're doing a run in a certain way, you can have alternate fingerings to get it smoother and stuff like that. So you're like literally having to think through like kind of the strategy of how you're going to do the fingerings alternately, depending on the piece of music you're playing. So it's like a whole other dynamic to it. And the saxophone is so expressive. You can, you know, dip into the notes and you can like get growling sounds out of it. You know, there's a reason why it's like an iconic like jazz instrument because you can you can interpret and do so many things with it. So I'm like exploring some of that. And I'm just like, oh man, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. So I think what I'm gonna do, I'm talking to Rachel about it, especially because Ellie's like starting to show signs of really liking it. So I'm like, if I had one around more, that'll only expose more to it. But like, I might get a tenor sax. I really, really wanna play the berry, mm -hmm. but it's just too far of a swing to just get a berry because they're thousands of dollars and I'm like, ah, I just can't, I got to prove to myself and to Rachel more that like, this is not just a temporary itch, but it's more of like a- Well, if one of the kids needs know. to play one in high school, you'll have it. Well, usually with the bigger instruments, the schools will have those instruments. Uh -oh. So they'll have, you know, that's what, that was my experience with like the bass clarinet, the contrabass clarinet, the schools will own them. And so it's like, if they have one you'll or You'll still two, take it home though? Yeah, you oh, still okay. get to take it home. You basically like rent it from the school. I see but they own it. So they, the school invests the thousands of dollars into it and you sort of pay the school and rent it and then you play it. But then once you graduate or whatever, or stop playing it, that's it. Or if some other kid's already playing it, well, guess what? You don't get to because they don't have another horn. So, you know, tenor sax is not quite as bad, but berry sax would be like no prayer. If the school doesn't have one, sorry, you're just not gonna play it. So not that Ellie's gonna try to play berry, but I want to. So anyway, having a blast. That's awesome. Watching YouTube videos. My my YouTube algorithm is so confused now because I, you know, now incorporating music into my woodworking and tractors and Rubik's cubes and, you know, history and science. It's basically just like, okay, whatever. We'll just throw random things into your feed because we don't know what you're up to. Like what, what you know, what large organization is watching this one YouTube channel because there's so many different things that 
is happening. You're probably just, they probably just think you're like a data farm or something like that. Probably. probably. They're like, they're just trying to like throw off the algorithm. Yeah. Um, anyway, having a blast, loving some music. Um, and then let's see here. I was thinking about starting out with No Shave November. Oh, right. We talked about that. I lasted five days. Oh, you did? Okay. I did. And then I I couldn't do I it. I forgot to try. Yeah. I, I have a CPAP machine that I have to wear oh, when I sleep. Oh, right. And as soon as I got a five day stubble, it wasn't seating properly anymore. And I was like, nope, it's not, I can't sacrifice my oh, sleep. Oh, interesting. I know it. people with full beards that have those. I don't know what I'm, what my whiskers are doing wrong, but oh, it's just like, it's already, I kind of struggle enough with it fitting properly. Yeah. I've got a weird head, I guess. Weird and, face. Uh, weird face, yeah. especially in particular. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't so, say that. I've just heard. Well, that's okay. You're not wrong. You know, it's, um, out, it's out in the streets. Yeah. So I thought about it. The last No Shave November in the streets. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I did it in 2016 because I still have pictures I of remember. me back at that time. Yeah, we both did it. Yeah, that was fun. And I was like, oh, I should do it again. I was like, I'm going to have way more grays in my beard now for sure. It's kind of part of why I want to do it. Yeah. But I'm going to look like 20 years older with a beard for sure. But I'm not going to do it. So, oh, well, maybe I never will. I mean, maybe if there's a reason to, to do it, that. If, if there's like, you know, next year, you know, if you wanted to actually do the mustache, you can like take October to do it. Yeah. And then, you know, have Maybe. something nice and full by the end of October. But like, if there's no reason for it, then yeah. like, you know. It's more just like for fun. Yeah. But it's fine. It's, it, for me, it's like, it's, it's like, I don't, I don't mind the way it looks. Yeah. But I can't even sleep yeah. with it. Like it, it itches so bad. I have very sensitive skin. You got to get past the itching phase, which I, takes like a month. I, I go, <laughs> I, I've gone a month and it mm. still itches. Like everybody always tells me, I'm like, yeah. oh, are you, are you conditioning it? I'm like, yeah. It's like. Yeah, you just got I've, a weird face, I think. It, I, <laughs> how dare you, sir? <laughs> I would never say that about you. Takes one to know one. Um, But yeah, no, I just yeah. like any, any time something touches my skin, I'm like, like, ah. Yeah. I don't know. I can't, I can't deal yeah, with that's it. That's no good. That's not good. Uh, last thing but not least, lots of leaves are falling. I'm doing lots of leaf blowing. That's my outdoor adventure right now. Except now we have the time change, so it gets dark at like Can't you just wait until they all fall and then leaf blow? Theoretically, but then it takes longer. And if it rains, then they like pack down uh, and get wet yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And Ugh. it like if you don't, like we got big like oak trees and stuff like that. And it just like blankets the grass and it will just murder the how, grass. How is your leaf identification, Brian? Um, it's probably better than most. Yeah. Better than most. I, 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 I of, deal with trees and I... I would like to know more about leaves and birds. I'd, I'd like to oh. be able to more quickly identify birds and leaves. I feel like that's a... These are both That's things. a hole in my game. Yeah. Leaves, you know. I don't... I leave. don't think either will benefit me in any way, but I'd just it's like not, to have it. It's not bad information to have. No. If you're like, I wonder what bird is in that tree, you can identify both, man. No. You just be like, you'll be all set. I, I I would I could I think I could get into bird watching. I'm boring enough for that. I think it's called birding. To, for those that know, no, that's when you ride them. <laughs> yeah, it's a very limited Pretty number sure. of birds. That like you can the do that with like the, yeah. like the rescuers. Yes. Yeah, you got to find an albatross. Ostrich. You can ride an ostrich. We don't have ostriches around here. <laughs> you probably find some. There's an ostrich farm somewhere. I'll find one somewhere. Yeah, they have emu farm. Emu farming is a big thing in Virginia. Actually, they have emu farms. You know, for like meat. You know. Oh, it's a thing. Yeah, emu meat. Yeah, it's more of like a wild, wild game type of meat. So if you don't want like as processed meat as like chicken, interesting. You know, a lot of people have emu. Didn't know that. That's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. All right. I don't know about ostriches though. They're a little, they're a little squirrelier. Oh. They're dangerous. Ostriches are powerful. They're freaking fast. They run like forty-five miles an hour. Oh yeah. They're terrifying. They are kind of terrifying. <laughs> they're like they're dinosaurs. They're like big dinosaurs yeah. basically. Anyway, they also don't bury their head in the sand. That is a common misconception, you know? Hmm. The whole notion of like burying your head in the sand because you don't want to deal with something. That's not why ostriches do that. Wait. It's not because they're afraid. But they do do it. They don't want to do it. The only reason they'll do that is to like protect their eggs or something. Oh. Or to like, or often they do it because it's hot and they mm -hmm. want to cool their heads off. So they just put it in the sand. Oh. But they don't do it because they're afraid. That's common misconception oh, if see. they're afraid they'll run or they'll attack you like right. a normal animal would yeah they'll bury your head in the sand yeah pretty much <laughs> anyway um that's about it for our personal stuff so we'll do a couple company updates and then we'll wrap this sucker up all right company updates we got a uh, new video we got out this week called fountain pen gifts at every price point i would love to know that well drew you can watch the video <gasps> or you already know does it have me in it help prepare it no oh Good. Major bonus. No <laughs> Drew in this video. 
Um, no, it's a good good video. So we we have a couple one. I mean, it's somewhat timely to the holidays, but it's not necessarily like a holiday themed video. <clears throat> but basically, the idea is if you have twenty five bucks, ten bucks, fifty, hundred, whatever, what do you get for somebody who's not like a diehard fountain pen person? Because they're probably gonna have a wish list and tell you exactly what they want. But for somebody that you're like. Maybe I want to get somebody into fountain pens who's not as knowledgeable. Um, I kind of curate some stuff to tell you exactly what to get. So go check that video out. Do you have Super a helpful. $10 list on there? Oh, there's, nice. there's a sub $10 stuff. I like that. And every price point, I did pen, ink, and paper. Oh. The options are very limited for under 10 Still, though. It's good to know. May or may not have include the pile of varsity because <gasps> it's both pen and ink. It'll last for 30 years, guaranteed. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. No. Uh, but anyway, yeah, go check out that video. So it's uh, lots of fun. Um, and then also because we did our video last week before Drew was certain whether he'd have the time to do a What's New video, you did a What's New video last week that we didn't talk about in the pencast, but you are hearing it now in this yeah. podcast. So go check it out. It was if action packed. You, yeah, and we are sold out of the uh, Magna Carta M600, but I did do a writing sample for that flex nib. So Mag if you wanted 600. to go and actually see how it writes, I did yeah. do uh, a video yeah. on that. So you can check yes. that out. Thankful. Yeah, Drew did that and then we sold them all. So good job. You Way know what? Go. Someone told me it was my job to sell fountain pens. I don't know where I heard that, but you know, I could have sworn somebody hired me to do that. I don't know. You never hype it. It was literally just like, this is what this pen yeah. does. And everybody was like, I want to go to there. Yeah. And there you go. That's what they did. So anyway, we're, we're restocking. We're getting more, yeah. but they come from India. So it takes a little minute, um, but we got more coming. So be ready for that. But go check out the video. Drew shows lots of cool new stuff. Yeah. And there. one thing that I didn't talk about in the new stuff, I'll mention this next week in the pencast and the new stuff, but for the month of November, we're going to be selling every Pilot Explorer with an included Con70 mm. converter. So that's going to be yeah. running through the month of November. So added bonus, the pen does take a nice large Con70. So check that out. Yeah. If you buy a, an Explorer, you get that for no added cost. So yeah. try the Explorer. It's a good pen. We're, we're calling this promotion Drew's Dream because he loves the Con70 so much. It was really his passion. I love the Explorer. To be able to include a Con70 with the Explorer. So. I like that everybody's getting a deal. That's what I like. There you go. Uh, also, if you buy a um, pen made by Monteverde, made by Conklin, Diplomat, Paniter, I don't think we're um, doing it with all of them. It's just Monteverde and Conklin. Monteverde and Conklin. Yeah. You'll get a free bottle of Blue Skies Inc., which is inspired by our Goulet Blue. So our, ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Enjoy that too. And I will awesome. say that again next week with the right information in there my brain. <laughs> in previous years, we've done it with all those other brands yeah. with Yaffa. But we're just, we're limited, a little more limited scope this year. Cool. Um, so yeah, check that out. And uh, also on more of a personal company front, Drew mentioned his scavenger hunt that we're going to do. So a lot of Drew work on Drew's part. Y'all won't really get to see or appreciate we, much we, of that. We, but we might, we might thing, share we, some pictures next we'll week. We'll share pictures. It'll be fun. But um, internally, it's a good you know morale booster and fun thing that we get to do. And we haven't done it since COVID, basically. Yeah, so. since uh, January of 2020. Yeah. Right before like, right everything. Right before COVID hit. Yeah. That was like the last like team pictures I had in my phone because uh, I run around and take pictures yeah. with everybody. And then COVID hit. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's when we used to see each other and do fun things. <laughs> and then three years went by and we're like okay we can do fun things again yes. um, anyway that's what we got going on and uh, yeah we'll wrap it up I want to thank you all for watching please leave us some feedback about how we're doing ask us some questions down in the comments so we can keep on keeping on uh, check out goodlypens.com our wonderful corporate sponsor selves um, for fountain pen ink and paper needs like and subscribe to YouTube Instagram TikTok all the places and I have a truly random fun fact today Thanks to my kids who like to uh, avoid talking about anything that happens at school or in their life uh, at dinner. You know, we asked, what'd you have for lunch today? Food. What'd you learn at school today? Nothing or stuff. It's most we get. But when we get random things that come up, I try and lean into it. And so I'm like usually looking up stuff on my phone of like, huh. I wonder what's the world record for number of hot dogs eaten or random, you know, random stuff like that. I'm like, let's find that out. So this is inspired by one of those random facts. Uh, the kids had like a whatever push up and sit up test, a physical fitness test at school. And they were talking about push ups. And I talked about how many I had to do when I was in the Corps of Cadets. I think I did like 87 in a minute or something like that, which is a lot of push ups. It was very fast. I was very fit back then. I'm not so fit anymore. But I was like, what is the world record for number of push ups? And 
there's different categories. It's one of these Brian Goulet kind of answers. Like it kind of depends because we don't have time do for a Brian Goulet type of answer. Um, but anyway, the the way that they do it now is they do a 24 hour period. You can rest as much as you want. This is how many push ups can you do in 24 hours? So they used to do it as just one continuous thing without stopping. The record was insane, but they stopped that in 1986. Anyway, currently the record for push ups in 24 hours is held by Charles Servicio in the US. Um, he achieved this on April 24th, 25th, that over that window, I guess, overnight, um, in April of 1993. Um, he actually stopped at 21 hours and 21 minutes. So he stopped early because I guess he had locked in. Um, he did 46,000 in one push-ups in a 24-hour period. So if you average that out over the 24-hour period, uh, it's an average of 36 push-ups per minute for a full 24 hours. That's insane. How entirely insane is that? Very. How, 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 how is that even possible? I don't even know. I wouldn't want to do that. That's crazy. So anyway, just in case you're curious. There you go. There's the record. Go break it. It's only been held for 30 years. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this pencast. Thanks so much for watching and right on. <laughs>